This game, oh, oh, oh this game, has some top-notch voice acting. Beautiful, I, I love it, it's, it's, it's mwah. Now that's comedy. Xenoblade, oh Xenoblade. When you first came out on the Wii, you were just... Oh jeez, what is that? But your captivating story won over many fans, and so the big N was like, Yeah, alright, make a game for our... Better console. <laughs> so we start off... Wait a minute. This is a Nintendo game. Minimize the footage. Again, flip it. Add some effects. More. Even I think this is too much. So the game starts off with our protagonist, Rex, scuba diving under... Clouds? Wait, clouds? Clouds? Okay, so let me get this straight. You got the ground, then you got the clouds up in the sky. Then you have the ocean, with a layer of clouds on top of it. It's like someone just copy-pasted the cloud layer and dropped it down like this. Man, that's some good imagery. Okay, I mean the cloud sea is pretty cool, but what the heck is that? Don't go raining on my parade, Gramps. Wait, so he's your granddaddy? Then who exactly are your parents? The Rex pulls up a safe and out pops Mr. Krabs! Come on, boy! Now the game gives us a look at the battle mechanics. Yep, those are some battle mechanics. Yeah. I'll get into this a bit later, but oh boy, do I have things to say on the battle mechanics. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Fine. <laughs> anyway, it's time for some backstory. This is a titan, and that's a dead one. Now titans are important as they are the land masses in the cloud sea. And so when they die, no more land for you, buddy. Crap. But sitting in the middle of all this stands a single tall tree. Now the rumor is that there is this place right at the top of the tree called Elysium, and it has enough land mass for everyone. Yay. But for now, Rex decides to pull up his Grampy Titan at the Argentum Trade Guild to sell his haul, and we get thrust into more gameplay tutorials. Oh boy. Now I'll get into this later. I seem to be doing that a lot lately. This game really doesn't do a good job of explaining tutorials, but all you need to know is this. Talk to the people with this thing on their heads. Visit places everywhere to unlock fast travel points, and pressing ZR shows your current objective. But whatever you do, don't mess with the camera. What? Anyway, we talk to this fuzzball. These are Nopon, a race in the Xenoblade universe, and all you need to know is that they speak like Yoda. Mm -hmm. And are sometimes pervs. Ooh, yeah. Now apparently catching Mr. Krabs was good for business, as the chairman, Bruce Banner, wants to see us. Okay, so this joke worked better in my head. So Mr. Banana wants us to do a job with a hundred thousand gold as payment. A hundred thousand? Yes, a hundred thousand gold. A hundred thousand? The job for us is to work with these three weirdos who call themselves Torna. We got Jin, Malus, and Nia. A child salvager. Okay, so this must be an Australian an accent. No, 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 wait, wait, it must be English. No, um, maybe it's Scottish? No, 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 wait, it's Welsh! Welsh! Now each of these guys are drivers, and these here are their personas. I mean, Jojo stands, I mean, Blades. And Nia being a cat girl, as a cat. So we made friends, and now we get ready for the job. This is where you can now buy things, as each major town has these shops that sell all kinds of trinkets. You also learn about salvaging. You know, the main thing Rex does for a Job. You buy these tanks and then have to pull off a mini game and depending on how well you do... Oh, dog! You pull up loot. And with that we are ready to take off with our international friends. Bazinga! <laughs> While on board, Rex and Nia have a little talk, by which I mean he rants on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Elysium is waiting for us. Dear God, not this crap again. And we finally get to do our job, which is to salvage something small from the bottom of the cloud sea. And by small I mean... A giant ship! So after pulling it up, we board the ship with our crew. Our team is always a max of three usable people at once, but you can swap them out if needed. Yeah, I'm not too sure I should pick you, buddy. And while Nia and Rex bond... 
We see the scariest scene possible. Gee, the rich dude who's a perv is evil. I never could have seen that coming. So descending down the ship, we get to more gameplay and how the battles play out in the open world. As unlike other JRPGs, you battle the enemy seamlessly with no transitions. So you see a monster, boom, you go attack them. The problem, however, is that when you are battling one monster, you might get pushed around and into the path of another and another, and that then never ends. So we find some crazy door, Ginny old boy tells us to open it up, and this is where we find her, Pyra. She's important to the story as- <laughs> Wait a minute, Jimbo, I wasn't done explaining. So Pyra here is a special kind of blade called the Aegis. That's the Aegis. And well, we are now kind of dead. So she offers half her life to revive us. In exchange, we promise to take her to Elysium because every single person in this game wants to go to that place. After that little bonding session, she is now our blade and we are her driver. Malos and Jin get mad because we took Pyra for ourselves and now we have to defend her. <laughs> Yeah, I'll get to this further on, but the voice acting can be, uh... Ah! And so now we get to battle Malos with Pyra helping out. Yes, help. Naturally being no help, and the fact that, you know, we're a little kid, we are forced to escape, with Nia helping us out because she kind of is against that whole killing us thing, and she also has a thing for Rex's scream. Ah! So in comes Gramps, who can fly now. Yes, you heard me. This old dude is just full of surprises. Yep, looks like we crash landed on this island and Gramps is missing. Oh no, how tragic. I guess we better go off and find the old weirdo. Ah! And so wandering the forest, our heroes find Gramps dead. No, Gramps, don't leave me here. There's still so much more things we had to do and wait, who the heck are you? So, ahem, titans when they die, turn into this naked little thing and start growing all over again. Think of him as a baby Gramps. Boy, that felt wrong to say. I am so confused right now. And I guess with a blade in one hand and a furball in our helmet, we continue searching for a way out of the forest and also finding Nia, I guess. Now here's where I'll get into a little bit more on the combat. So you press A to initiate an attack, and once you do, Rex will go into an auto attack. Now while this happens, you build up these three moves on the right, and using them shows up a special move unique to each blade. This then levels up this thing on the right, and pressing A, depending on the level, unleashes a super button prompt special attack. But remember how I said the game wasn't really good at explaining things? Well, let's see. For about five hours into the game, this was all I thought the combat was. Yes, just this. But if you gander your eyes a little higher up the screen, you can see this on the right. So after you use a special move, this tree opens up depending on the element. Now after that, you must use a level 2 special and then a level 3. And if you have trouble with this, your allies also use their own special move and with a button press, you can use them to help build up the tree. Now if the meter on the left is high enough, you press start and it kicks off this super duper secret tag team team attack, where you all gang up on your enemy. Then you do one button prompt per person, and if you can destroy this orb which matches the element of the tree, you get to go again. Now when this is all said and done, the damage, <laughs> oh, the damage. Also the bar will naturally build up with attacks, and you can use one bar to revive a fallen ally, including the AI reviving you. Hurry up and revive me! So the reason I went into detail on that is because for the life of me, I did not understand this at all from the game. I had to look up guides for this because I couldn't believe that this was all there was to the combat. I am probably just dumb. But once you know this, the combat becomes insanely more fun and tactical as your eyes are always darting around the screen looking for what to do next. A problem though is that a lot of the monsters early game are so weak that they die too quickly before you can even build up the tree. But trust me, when you get to mid to late game, this is so addicting. Anyway, look! I'm riding a tiger. <laughs> Okay, so I gotta bring this up as well. While everyone is sleeping, Pyra and Gramps have a secret little chat where it's revealed that this thing has met her, knows how important she is, and doesn't tell any of this to Rex. This happens more than once in the game. He knows so many things that could help everyone but keeps quiet for reasons. I guess it does help cement the idea that Rex is still a kid and everyone around him is an adult who knows more things than he should. I do like that aspect of it though. Just stop looking so smug about it. 
Rex finally notices that Nia is a cat girl. Well, took you long enough. Or Gormotti, as is the technical term. And the place where they landed is her birth land. Uh, birth titan. Anyway, the next stop is the capital, Torogoth. Level 75? Nah, I'm sure I'll be fine. Banana! Uh, finally, we made it to Torigoth, the cat people capital. And we see that Nia is now on the FBI's most wanted list for being associated with Torna. Here we learn that yes, you can get more blades. As we see one dude literally die trying to awaken a core crystal. Think of them like Pokeballs. You resonate with them and bam, you're either dead or you get a new blade. Okay, you're not really dead, don't worry, it's a Nintendo game. <laughs> okay, so I think it's a good time to bring up the voice acting. <laughs> No, not the actual voice actors, because I think they nailed a lot of the voices for the characters, but the voice direction is atrocious. So you would have a sentence, but instead of getting the voice actors to record the line in one go, it's like, no, nah, okay, record this bit today, uh, come back tomorrow and we'll finish the rest of the line. I know most TV shows have the actors record while the animation is there on screen to try and match the lips. What does the Aegis even mean? Well, okay, they don't clearly do that here, but it's like the voice actors didn't even know what was the context for some of these lines. And as usual, the worst contender for this was dear old Gramps. I remember crashing through many trees before landing here. We seem to have attracted the guard since we hold the powerful Aegis, and Nia subsequently gets captured in this mess by the blue fire blade. This is an Ethernet! <laughs> but we managed to escape. Don't let them escape! Kinda annoys the head military man. Jeez! So to lay low, we hide with the help of this Nopon, Tora, who isn't really a driver, but is smart enough to make his own mechanical blade. So he dresses up as a maid in his quiet time. Okay, but seriously, Poppy is actually a really good character. It's just a shame her introduction was with this dude. Now, while we deal with these pervy fuzzballs and a naked grandpa on the table, the head inquisitor of the military comes in to meet up with her blade to capture Pyra. I mean, sure, hey, what's one more person chasing after us gonna change? So Pyra dresses up as an Ewok from Star Wars, and we wander the streets looking for Nia. This is where the game opens up a bit more with the shops and menus. Now, I won't go into much detail here, but the game really lets you customize your playstyle to suit your needs. However, one, always open this menu. It has blade abilities and they don't actually unlock until you open the menu, even though the game tricks you. And you will need to level these up to use the field abilities, which actually are needed to get through the game. And two, you can roll for more blades. So it's like a gambling system without microtransactions, where you find core crystals in the world and roll for a new blade. Some are terrible. Ew. And some look so amazing amazing with their own cutscene and everything. The game, however, auto-saves after each roll, so no cheating here. So after asking around, we find that Nia is being held in the big military ship, and Rex has a clever idea. I guess we'll just have to mount a full-on attack. No. How about instead, Rexy boy? We wait for low tide and sneak in from the bottom, huh? Ah, uh, pretty, pretty smart, eh? So before we go out, we learn that Tora will come along to help us with his artificial blade, Poppy. After a small fee, of course. Assist? How exactly? Nothing illegal. I hope. Game. See what I mean when I say this dude creeps me out? Now the process to level up Poppy is different to normal Blade since she actually isn't a real Blade. You have to play this game called Tiger Tiger, which is like a salvager thing where it auto scrolls down, you pick treasure and you dodge enemies. Did I mention how freaking hard this mini game was? Anywho, we make it through the secret opening and sneak around the military base. Wow, world has many amazing places in it! Perhaps rest and enjoy view for a bit. View? What view? I mean, metallic endless hallway, sure, that's a view. Um, I didn't hurt anyone, did I? We rescue Nia and are home free. And I am no fool. Oh, and now we are home free. Uh, so Morag here wants to haul us in since apparently Pyra caused the almost end of the world 500 years ago. Rex being the goody 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 two shoes believes in the heart of the cards. I mean, his friends. And decides to take down Morag by toppling a water tower on top of her. Ah uh, yes, you see, water defeats fire in Pokemon so if you use the move Surf then you can do... 
I want to reach Elysium. What? Not this again. Ugh, fine, I'll guess I'll stay since he's kinda cute. Boy! Now after escaping, we try and find Tora's friend who has this ship that can get us off this island. But getting there is no easy feat because... Oh yeah, please stop following me! Darn! Why here? Or just you wait and see, buddy. I'll be back for you. So we reach his uncle friend, Guy. You became very big in one year, Tora. Thanks, mate. Who, after a bit of messing around, gives us his ship and we use it to take us to the world tree. But our heroes are attacked by none other than Rayquaza. Into the belly of the beast we go. Ah, belly of the titan. Stop looking at me like that, Gramps. And in said belly, we meet a big individual. Oh look, it's an Aussie. And of course they stick the Australians down under far away from everyone because everything here just costs so much money. Anyway, meet Van Dam, a leader of mercenaries. And let rip with a fart. So after he takes us back to his headquarters, he requests of us to help him on mercenary business and we're like, yeah, sure, okay, why not? Oh, wait, you're actually joining our party? Yeah, no, you, you, you don't really seem main character material. Um, hello? I said get out of my party. Some people, seriously. Listen up, kid. Drivers use farts. While on the bench, Van Dam teaches us that when blades die, they actually return back to their core crystals. They can get awakened after a while, but they lose all of their memories. Now this one element is a huge driving force to the story of the game, so don't forget it, kiddos. Quiz later on in the day. Give me a look at that. So after Van Damme gets released by the FBI, he tells us that it's odd that Pyra and Rex both feel each other's pain because Blade shouldn't really feel anything. I guess it's because, oh, I don't know, half of her heart is in Rex? Wait a minute. Heart? Is this Xenoblade? Or is this actually... Now when we get back, we find this dude, Akos, who works for Torna alongside Malos and Jin. He tries to capture Pyra, but Mr. Ozzy scares him off. And afterwards, he tells us we should go to the capital of Australia, I mean Uriah. Yeah. To then find someone to help us with our Pokemon problem. But we get interrupted on the way by actual, literal JoJo characters. <laughs> Well anyway, we move on and reach the capital. Man, this city is so real and lifelike. Look, that sure is some realistic arm wrestling. So we arrive at the theater to find a dude who can maybe help us catch Rayquaza to then get to the world tree. But instead we book tickets to Hamlet, which then turns out to be a play detailing that war where apparently Pyra destroyed half of the world. Here's a short version. Hi, I'm Adam. Hi, Adam. God, Mr. Architect, give me power. Okay. Die, demon. Yay, I win, but oh no, three continents die. Oh well. Wait, why are people angry? The end. And after that riveting performance, we meet the Aussie's friend who's dying or something. <laughs> but he tells us to come back tomorrow to give us this thing to catch Rayquaza. Uh-oh. This sounds like a plot device that will mean something evil will happen in that one day break. I'm sure this modern JRPG won't resort to... Uh. So dead dude's little girl thinks Akos can save her dying grandpa, he kidnaps her. And then Malo suddenly appears in Pyra's dream grass place to tell her to come alone to save the girl or we'll kill her. Wait. What? So we gotta go save her. But since Pyra is gone from the party, we gotta use other blades. Oh no, not other blades. I guess I'll roll for some spare ones. Oh, what a big boy. And we make it in the nick of time to fight Malos. You know, an epic boss battle with epic music to match. Oh. Yay. And then in the strangest choice, happy music starts to play and yep. And damn dies. I don't know, maybe I'm just big brain smart or the game was really cliche, but man, I knew he would die. Hence why I never used him in my party earlier. But this moment allows Pyra to awaken her hidden blade form, which was the mode that destroyed almost the entire planet 500 years ago. Yes, it's time for Mithra. 
Damn, she's strong. Allowing Rex to have this future sight move readability. Don't worry, you can't use this in battle, it's only for story cutscenes. Wait, what? But she can call down the heavens to absolutely obliterate the enemies. We gotta retreat. Now Mithra, well, she... Why did you wake me up? She's a bit grumpy. But... I also like this scene as it actually shows that Rex is still a kid. And like I said earlier, if you understand that mentality, that he's still a child, it will make a lot of the scenes later on work really well. So Pyra gives us an explanation dump on how she's so crazy strong as Mithra. And that Malos is another Aegis just like her. Wait. Nani? There was also this one dude who climbed the world tree to meet Mr. Architect, but couldn't find anything at Elysium. So as proof of that, you know, he climbed a freaking tree, he stole two core crystals being Malos and Pyra. He woke Malos first to being evil, destroyed half of the earth till Adam, remember him, woke Mithra to then stop him at the cost of three titans. Mithra, hating what she did, created a weaker form being Pyra and sealed herself away. So the only reason that Pyra wants to now go to Elysium is to find a way to once and for all defeat Mr. Malos. Now I know that the game likes to portray them both as equal, but Pyra literally says Mithra is a stronger version. So I never used Pyra in my entire playthrough after this. Oh, and yeah, Gramps is like, I fought in this old battle. Oh, I'm so old and horny. Oh, Rex, sorry, you're too young to know all this. <laughs> also, by the way, this dude <coughs> is actually a flesh eater or a blade who people in the olden times fused with human cells. Hence why he's dying early instead of living forever like a normal blade. Anyway, Aldi here gives us a blade that can be used to help reach Elysium, but since he's a blade, he reckons his driver would actually be best suited to helping us. And he is at Indol, which is kind of like the big, neutral, churchy place of the world. So to get there, Rex decides to go back to Argentum, then to Moradain, the military capital, and then to Indol. Yes, simples. Well, we get back to Argentum and this is fine. <laughs> So it's been a while and the group decides to get some rest and, uh, well, uh... uh, uh. <gasps> <gasps> group! Monster! She's certainly exposing an awful lot of skin. Hot meat kettle. Yeah, what, mate? Say it to my face and not online and we'll see what happens. Have you looked in a mirror recently? <gasps> So the morning after, Rex is panicking like crazy that he almost held hands with a real girl, while Gramps and the tiger watch on. We need a little romance in our lives too, me? <laughs> I can't do this, this dude is so creepy. Actually, I'm quite alright. My, my, my. Will you get out of here? Stop with these horny old men! Oh yeah, and hi Alphonse. Yes. So this here is the prince, uh, king, uh, kid of Moradain, the big military continent, and also the brother of Morag. Received reports of an attack on a ship headed for the Praetorium. Okay, seriously, how can you even read like this? So we get some more political talk, which really isn't that interesting to us at the moment. The Senate. Do it. But more importantly, we got some blades to roll. Now do you see why the title of the video is like that? And with that, some kid steals Van Damme's blade core crystal, we chase them, beat them up, kill some people, the end. And that was Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Yeah, well I gotta say I love this game so much, but I'll be completely honest, it does start extremely slow with the loading and the slow talking, the fact that the early game monsters die so quickly, making the battles feel incredibly boring without the tree chain attacks, not to mention the ton of generic anime cliches. But still these are just minor gripes, as boy oh boy this game is really stunning. I mean just look at some of these backgrounds, the story while it starts off slow, with the small group gradually picks up into some really engaging stuff and all the characters you meet are great except this one but sadly the game ends here as rex and his crew fly off into the distance never to be seen again you know what maybe just maybe i can do another part to this Why 
you so frightened by our power that you wet yourself, furry ears? Did I what? She's got a lot of nerve, you one-eyed monster. Neo, you can't just go around saying that to people. Mithra, tell her to say sorry. Shut up! Uh, I think my game is broken. No. Now that's comedy. Yay, I can finally upload this! I want to talk about the whole game, so I'll split it up into parts. And maybe set a really low light goal, since... Uh, uh, what could go wrong? You really like Xenoblade, don't you? No. But also, hello, to any new viewers here. There is actually a part before this over here, and in the description and comments, so please check that out first, as it covers a lot of the story and gameplay. Don't worry, I'll wait. Uh, this is taking too long. Ugh. So you're the main protagonist, and you're the waifu, then who's flying the plane? <laughs> So our gang of Rex, Pyra, Comma, Mithra, Nia, Mufasa, Perv, and Poppy all crash on Moradain. And holy moly, we are underleveled! <laughs> This desert area is very dusty and also home to the military capital. And once we head there, we meet another one of these things. Oh, Tora not remember me at all. It's Mui Mui. I was assistant of Professor Su Su. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Mui Mui not very interesting, so Tora forgot he exists. Man, Tora, you cold AF. This apparent assistant to Tora's dad said he was getting some adult magazines, and when he came back, the dad disappeared. Well, that was pointless then. So we wander the town, buying equipment and so on, till we reach an inn, which has a hot spring in a Japanese game. Oh, no! Nice bod you've got there. Please, Nia, don't tempt the YouTube headquarters. No, I just thought it's been fun lately. You're a sicko, Rex, you know that, right? But so the military seems to be up in arms over some commotion, and we go to investigate, which means kill innocent military soldiers. Will we try to do that? The juice. They then find the thing causing the ruckus, and it's another artificial blade who looks like... Poppy? And was made by Tora's Gramps. Why is every grandpa in this game horny? <laughs> so we fight the blade called Lila, but she escapes. And Tora remembers fondly on that time, back in the day, where he would work naked with his dad and Gramps making a goth-made robot. Yes, this was as weird for me to read out loud as you think. How rude! But we then see the moment of his granddaddy's death. Don't you have any idea who the attackers were? Tora have no idea! Tora then realizes that the only one who could finish making Lila was his dad, meaning that he's alive somewhere. Well, I guess it's time for his story arc. But then, all of a sudden, Morag and Bridget come in with soldiers. They mistake Poppy for Lila and try to arrest us. Oh look, it's another cutscene where we easily win, but the story says otherwise. So we continue to fight till, uh, this, uh, Spy not on thing comes in and is like, Hey, forget about it, you got the wrong girl. Morag apologizes and we join forces to find Tora's dad and that other blade. So now the mission is to find people who sold parts to make Poppy as they would have needed the same parts to make Lila. Be careful everyone, I think someone might be following us. Oh crap, he's onto me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't suspect a thing. Our investigation leads us to a factory in the middle of the desert. But standing in our way is the old Jojo couple. Oh, it's Shalad. Yes, wait! Seems that insult was a bit too much as he breaks out his most powerful move. Sunlight to you. Well, anyway, 
We make it inside the factory to find that they are mass producing artificial blades. What? And deeper down we see Tora's daddy pond. But oh uh, no, the mysterious blue thing comes in revealing himself as the traitor. And he was doing this all for... <laughs> this dude, remember? From the first part? Anyway, he's been making all these fake blades and selling them off to whomst ever wants them. They then send Lila to attack us, but with the power of friendship... Yeah. We managed to wrangle her back to our side while the two Nopon flee. And honestly, I kinda weirdly love this area of the game. Unique setting with many different sections to explore, lots of treasure to find, and these weird bird enemies. We reach the end of the factory to only witness an earthquake. What? 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 what what's all this shaking? What the heck is going on? <laughs> This is too ridiculous for words! So we fight, uh, a giant robot made piloted by two pervs. Yeah. Hoppy then comes in and, uh, Super Saiyan transforms! This energy's incredible! Uh, yeah, this is Poppy QT. And with such a powerful form, she barely uses it in the rest of the game. Wait, what? We then defeat the giant mech and chase Banana down to get him to stop making the fake blades. See, talking things out can always solve problems. What the? These are the other two members of Torna. The team from earlier that really wanted the Aegis. That's the Aegis. And we almost lose to them, but Morag comes in to save the day. But uh, yeah, I forgot. I mean, we have the frickin' Aegis. Boy! This attack destroys their blades. Ugh. And before more fighting can break out, another character steps in, who is from Indol, you know, that big, holy, important place. And the other two flee while they can. Now with this new character, the game sort of picks up again with a whole bunch of new story developments. Because frankly, I was getting a bit tired of Tora's daddy pawn issue. We cut back to Jin, the leader of Torna, who reassures someone named Laura that it is almost time while she is frozen in stasis. And then it cuts back again to 500 years ago, where Mithra was with that savior to the world, Adam, as he spars with Laura. We also see Jin, Bridget, and that new Indol girl. Well, this is all nice and such, but I miss my racing car. <laughs> So back to the present. The party is on a ship headed to Indol. The girl introduces herself as Fan Lanorn. She tells us that the Praetor Amalthus, who is the distributor of all blades to drivers, wishes to meet old Rexy boy. Rex only agrees to it after finding out that Amalthus is also the driver of Coughing Man. <coughs> and Malos the big old baddie. Also one thing to note, here we see more of the blades' memories being erased after they return to their crystal, as both Bridget and Fan were there in the past, but neither remembers Mithra, who as the Aegis can remember things throughout time. We then cut back to Jin again. Isn't he popular? Where those two bozos report what happened. Ugh. Akos also tells them the brief political thing I mentioned earlier, which was where more Ardain was digging around and finding this old technology called Judicium. Interestingly, this is where those tests were done to create the blade-human hybrids like Mr. Coughing Man. <laughs> so cut back again to Rex. Jeez, my head is spinning from all this cutting. Where we land on these beautiful floating islands, which is where Rex actually lives. Pyra is very eager to see Rex's parents no. and insists they travel there. And so they go and do that. Now this place is probably my favorite in the entire game. I mean the whole place just screams tropical resort. Well, until you fall off, meaning you have to swim all the way around again. Oh, that's great. And I mean this place is great for leveling up your battling skills. Before I mentioned that early game fighting wasn't that fun. Well this area is where that starts to change. With huge monsters that take a while to defeat. Meaning you can have fun practicing all those chain attack combo thing. I, I, I forget what I called them. Well just be careful when all the rewards fall off to the side. Gee thanks Nintendo. And after a fun while we reach Rex's hometown. And are greeted by the children. And this lady, who is the caretaker of Rex. 
old lady have lots of little ponds? SMH, you can build advanced AI, but you sure are a dumb sucker potato. Rex then takes Pyra to meet his parents, who are dead. Oh. Uh, I'm honestly so impressed with Rex. He didn't have any parents around, yet he still works for himself and sends a lot of money back to the village. Great guy, really. Back at the lady's house. He's never brought a girl to meet me before. Uh huh? You do hear of blades and drivers getting married a lot in the old stories. Uh... She tells us Rex's backstory and that he actually wasn't born in town, but instead his dying mother brought him with a last breath, and they found his dead dad only a few miles away. Pyra notions how maybe she should not be with Rex since they would only bring more tragedy to his already tragic life. The lady assures her that everything will be fine, and off we go to reach the ship to finally take us to Indol. But of course, the Jojo couple is back again. You wanna join the fun too? Get out. And here we learn that he's the crown prince of Tantal? That's the other big continent, by the way. Now this is more like it. Ooh, come on. Yeah, keep it coming. Mm. Oh, I will you. After we beat him, he concedes that he actually works for Indol, keeping an eye out for us and to test us if we're actually strong enough. But well, he always has the worst luck. Not me! Should we go rescue him? Nah. So we finally make it to Indol and decide to be tourists. And instead we see anti-blade protests on the street. There are a lot of politics with this as Indol gives people blades, but some people don't want blades to exist at all. And then you have more Ardain, whose titan is dying, which is why they are sneaking off doing military things and trying to steal the cat people's land. Fan allows us to stay in the capital to enjoy the sights. Ew. And we find her staring at this huge painting. Beautiful. Has somebody got a little crush? I wonder what Pyra and Mithra would think. Hey, no! She ponders on the thought of forgotten memories as we cut to Pyra and Bridget discussing similar things. Gee, is that all Blades talk about these days? Bridget, however, says that she remembers a lot of her past since she kept a diary during those past lives and knows what Mithra did back then and that she should tell Rex before it hurts him later. But we then go to see the Praetor, a Malthus, while a flashback shows us again that he was that dude who climbed the tree to get the two core crystals being Mithra and Malos. We're the same, you and I. I consider us equals. I feel a bit better now you've put it that way, your eminence. So Rex pleads his case to be allowed to climb the world tree because when he finds Elysium, he then can stop that war over the dwindling land. Amaltha says he used to think like that too and yeah, sure, why not? No harm letting the kid try. Rex then trips out seeing Malos in place of a Malthus. Hmm, I wonder if he also ate some bad mac and cheese. Jeez. Meanwhile, Ginny O'Boy lands on Temperantia, the neutral zone that Ardanians were digging in. The place is also home to these giant super bug weapon things, which is why Moradain had set up camp here to try and grab them for the war. Jin however sneaks in and then uses the machine to open the world of light to attack the Orion soldiers stationed on the island. This is then misunderstood as Moradain attacking the other and word travels to Morag who suspects that Torna might be the cause behind this. So away we go. We arrive on the island and find the beast is still rampaging. Morag tells us to jump on its back and attack the power cables to stop it vaporizing everyone. And so we go and do that. Well, not right away, because of course it has a defense mechanism. A what now? After that, Jin pops out and confronts us. Mithra questions him as to why he was helping Malos, when in fact he was a good guy back in the day. Jin accuses Mithra as her power caused the kingdom of Torna to fall during the war, which led to the death of Laura. He also reveals that he is a blade himself, but hates the fact that blades have those horrible rewritten memories each life. And due to that, humans were able to conquer the blades. He says that Malos woke his eyes to this, which is why he tries to kill us. Fan, whose ability can stop any blade, tries to slow him down, but of course, as the evil sexy ninja bad guy, he resists. And within a blink of an eye, he kills her. You are no slave. Be free now. 
with her last breath. She reminds Jin of Laura when she died. And this along with the old anime too much power trope stops his attack. But of course, Akos comes in to whisk him away. And we are stuck here. Rex sad he couldn't stop another death. While the two warring sides are about to blast each other out of the sky. Now take a guess as to what happens next. Too late. Amalthus commands his frickin' titan of Indol to come in between them to stop them. Yes, the literal entire land we were just roaming. And so the chapter ends. This is too ridiculous for words. It is here where we get the backstory on the whole Jin and Laura thing. Where it shows a young Laura awakening Jin back in the day. This, however, annoys the heck out of her dad, who almost kills her. But Jin comes in the way and kills him first and saying how he will always be there to protect her. Anyway, back to the Titan Wars, Indol's huge presence puts a ceasefire in place and invites Prince Alphonse from Moradain and Rakura from Australia, I, I mean Uriah, to talk things out. <laughs> But of course, stick the old Aegis in any room and stuff gets done. Naturally. She and Zeke convinced them that it was Malice's fault, and that in fact, Malice is pretty weak right now. Which is why he wants to return to Elysium to heal his broken core crystal up. Amalthus then reminds everyone that he was the dude who climbed the tree. And yes, yes, mate, we all know how it's your fault. Naturally. Meanwhile outside, the three musketeers Ugh. plot to kill the leaders since they all are here in one place. But that's dumb. We still got more story to go through. No, tell us why you're really here. Ugh. Well, it's to info dump Jin's plan, which is to open a path to the world tree to kill the actual god architect and then all of humanity. Oh, that's great. Now, because Fan was highly regarded in Indol, she is given a huge funeral. But good old Nia has no time to be respectful at a funeral. So wait. You're saying you want to go be clingy, or what? I'll burn you. Sheesh. They also do remark how Fan didn't turn into a crystal like before, but instead it got split in half like with Rex and Mithra. It's almost as if someone stole her core crystal. Hmm. Anywho, we finally get back on track to our original goal. To catch Rayquaza. Uh, I mean, defeat the serpent thingy that to able to reach the tree. Uh, Ugh. We learn that this thing was actually Mithra's pet. Yeah, but died during the war. And Amalthus tells us that the Kingdom of Tantal were the ones who revived him and told it to stop anyone approaching the tree through control of the Omega Feta Cheese. Cheese. Plus, they also made a big black hole at the bottom to deter even more people. How did they manage a feat like that? As I've said, mankind is regressing. Ah, uh, you know, that doesn't explain anything. Naturally. Zeke finally gets his big old character growth since he is the Prince of Tantal and says that his people are actually descendants of Adam who was part of that Torna country. You know, the dude that everyone blames. After he sealed Mithra away, he founded Tantal. And so with Zeke on our team, we head there. Mm, luck of Zeke, not so great. Bet we shipwrecked by tomorrow. <laughs> And oh boy, we jump cut to another different group where we see the more Ardane crew discussing that they will meet the Aussies to try and work out peace. But then that weird spy Nopon thing from before tells them that Banana plans to kill all the leaders there. And so again, we gotta go and try to find out what he plans to do. And so we investigate. Why can't I buy more cookies? Ahem. No. But seeing as how we are bumbling fools, we mistakenly think he's gonna poison the guests as he hired those birds from the factory as the chefs. Poison! That food is poisoned! No. Mr. Banana here instead tries to blow them up. Just well, he sure made it more powerful. But we defeat the giant mech maid, and this annoys Banana, who pulls a kamikaze move and blows up the mech to kill everyone there. Alphonse, however, charges in and gets his blade to save everyone at the cost of his life. Much to the shock of the Aussies. And we now lost another member. Then in honestly a mind-blowing scene, Nia tells her blade to distract everyone while she transforms, showing a core crystal on her, and then proceeds to super heal him back from the dead. Wait, 
What? And then it's like, hey, you dumb dumbs, he was all right. <laughs> Don't you ever breathe a word of this to anyone, all right, kiddo? This is too ridiculous for words. So, uh, yeah. Alphonse sends Morag to help us, and we finally go to the kingdom of Tantile. Say, chum, which one do you fancy, Pyra or Mithra? Definitely Captain Crunch Cereal. Wait, that's not what I was asking. I said Captain Crunch Cereal. You like it? So on the way, we learn that Zeke was disowned for wanting to venture outside the kingdom to explore the world. I.e. he's got daddy issues. Shut up and sit down, chum. This'll be great. Oh yes, I'm sure it will be. So Zeke gets his blade Pandoria to call up the Titan of Tantal, which actually just swims around I'm under the sea. It sure is cold. Nia, do you, um, mind? Uh... You're just so warm. Did I hear something naughty just now? No. So after some yeti hunting, we arrive at the palace, a rundown area where we then meet the nice king. Oh no, he's not a nice king at all. The king imprisons us and captures Pyra, telling his son that he plans on destroying the Aegis for the good of the world. He was able to capture us somehow by stopping the ether flow in the weapons, rendering the blades useless. But with some JRPG trickery, Morag had told Tora beforehand to make Poppy store some of her energy in herself just for this moment. See Tora, you can use your blade for non pervy things. You small little sicko. You what? We then cut to Zeke pondering about his friend's dilemma. And the only reason I mention this scene is that Zeke tells his blade that Rex can be the one to save his kingdom since his heart is pure. And that as a child, Zeke who is the adult has to help guide him. Keep in mind this for the end game. Anyway, after so much time wasting, Poppy finally bursts down the door and the group rush to find Pyra while teaming up with Zeke. We then find her and what? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Did they just point a cannon at her? Yes. Are you nuts, mate? Yes. They plan on overloading her with ether energy to kill her, but not before we come rushing in. Zeke and Poppy push the cannon to miss hitting Pyra, and it destroys something not important. I'll say this. Pyra! 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 So the king then comes clean, saying that these people aren't actually descendants of Adam, but rather used his name to help unite the country after Adam abandoned them. However, Pyra reveals, through some mystical magical hologram thing of Adam, with a pre-recorded message that he didn't want to come back, and that he sealed her away as a trial, because only when humans and blades can learn to live together, then she can save the world. Uh, that sounds a bit confusing. Can you explain it in a bit more detail? No time for that! The Titan is crashing further into the ocean! As that not really important thing earlier was important! It was the Omega Feta Cheese which Pandoria used to control the ship's depth, meaning down with the ship we go. But of course, as the goody goody main character, we go to repair it since Pyra says it's just like the thing she used to control Rayquaza, so it should be no problem for her. Uh... The way the king was acting, I can't help feeling there's something more to it. You think Indol is holding something else over Tantal? Do you know anything about those days, Gramps? Hmm? No, I was somewhere else at the time. Jeez, Gramps. What's the point of keeping an old timer like you around if you don't even know anything? Oh, <laughs> he said it! What I've been saying for these past two videos. Rex? We also get a little tidbit here, where Pyra tells us that she has two artificers, Rayquaza and Siren, or the thing that helps shoot those light beams earlier. Malus even has some of his own, but Pyra doesn't know why the architect even gave her these, and she wants to go to Elysium to find out. Open a chest, it might turn out great, but until then it's just a crepe. <laughs> Rex. We then find the Omega Feta cheese, which Pyra manages to repair and removes it so they can use it on Rayquaza. Can you fix it? Shut up. I'm sorry. But while leaving, we are blocked by the three goofballs. Ugh. And we easily defeat them. <laughs> uh, uh. 
Ginny old boy comes in with some ultra instinct power levels as he can now control the elements and move faster than light itself. Sorry, what? This is too ridiculous for work. Ah! This is some really crazy anime nonsense. I mean, he destroys our entire team and isn't even phased by Siren's OP laser attack. Oh, well, he's about to kill Rex by removing his crystal. Because remember, Rex is technically dead already. But Pyra stops him by focusing the laser on herself, saying she'll destroy the Aegis if he doesn't let Rex go. Jin agrees and kidnaps Pyra. Pyra! And leaves Rex all alone again. The poor kid who really cannot do anything to change the world. Word of the Aegis being captured by Jin reaches Indol, where Amalthus ominously says prepare the ceremony, and then this gem on the Titan starts to glow. We then cut back to Rex and Tantal, having awoken to find no Pyra or Mithra, and he makes the sudden decision to leave the group and return to be a salvager, because all in all, he's just a little kid. Pyra doesn't deserve him, and he feels she's actually better off with Malos than with him. This, of course, leads to a heart breaking scene as Nia, Bridget, and even Poppy cry out at Rex that this is not the Rex they know. He should be understanding how much pain Pyra must be in to do all this just for him, and that she would never want to leave his side. This sad scene is then interrupted by a summon from the king. He tells us more of the history of Tantal and that to be able to hide the Titan under the sea, Indol only allowed it if they gave up one resource core crystals. Yes, the crystals which are made from the titan's energy were used as payment to Indol to keep hush about the whole country thing. And as a result, the climate grew colder and the whole country now is in poverty. Indol ain't the pretty clean country we all thought it was. In fact, the letter he brought from Amalthus, which he thought was just asking for aid, actually said that Indol now wanted the Omega Feta cheese. And as such, the king was worried that if he said no, they would use the E just to obliterate his country, so he thought to destroy it first. He also reveals a more interesting tidbit. A third Aegis Blade. You what? Yes, while there exists Pyra and Mithra, there also sits a more powerful third blade, which Adam himself couldn't wield, and thus locked away. This whole speech rallies Rex, who now feels he was the one holding the Aegis back, and maybe this sword can unleash their true potential. And... <laughs> Oh, uh, what do you know? Graham suddenly says, Oh boy, Rex, you sure are ready. I know everything about this. <laughs> Let me take you to the blade. And I know this is normally done in JRPGs to help the main character grow. But Gramps, come on. Don't play dumb. So we head there while Gramps tells us that Adam himself made him guard the third blade. Now the place is near Rex's hometown, and as such only one of his kind can open the door to it, which is also why Jin needed Rex on that earlier excavation. Now while we go down it seems that the tiger had a bit too much to drink. <laughs> And Gramps reveals another thing he kept secret. Because I don't know, he likes seeing the tiger suffer. Mm. He tells us that the cave actually has a power to limit blades. No, not just in a story sense. This place actually limits your moves. Meaning you can't do any super duper combos here. And holy moly. I dislike this place so much. Run for your life, Tora. Don't look back, just keep running. So anyway, I hate this place so much. You for real? And here's another tidbit. Zeke is actually a blade eater. Not a blade turned human, but a human with blade parts. As while traveling, he almost died. Amalthus found them and not to erase his blade's memories, took part of her crystal and put it in Zeke. <laughs> Reminds you of something from earlier? Seems like Indol ain't the goody good. Yeah, okay, you get the point now. And I guess, well, the cave of death is good at bringing out people's backstories. Cause here's Nia. So she was from a rich family, but her sister grew extremely ill, and eventually both she and her father died while searching for her cure. Nia alone found her dad's core crystal and awakened Dromark, and later they were captured by Indol, but Jin came in to save her and had her join Torna. Also by the way, this cave is still stuck. 
stupid. I swapped out team members since I couldn't handle Rex without Mithra. And well, see for yourself. Well done. This is you the culmination of years. I'm all right. This can't forgive me. I'm a juice. It was joke. No. We then head deeper into the cave, and yeah, this was the worst segment in the entire game for me. So there's this spider cave, and there are these bridges that collapse. And now if they collapse, you end in this spider heck hole. With literally no way out, apart from this burnable web. Now in the first part I mentioned the field skills, and having them in your main party can do these things in the overworld. Now naturally you would assume stuff like this is for optional quests. Naturally. But oh uh, no. To proceed in the main story, you have to burn this web. There is no other way. And I literally spent hours here because I did not have the blades on me to open this. And what with the handicap in this tunnel meant that I couldn't even defeat the spiders. So I would go in, dying again and again, trying to see how to get through without going through this web. I then decided to meditate on it and not look up anything online. And oh boy, guess I gotta farm some blades to go through to get the skills to burn the web. There was one more section later on which was much worse, but seriously this was my one major gripe with this game. You somehow needed active blades that had all these skills to progress the story, and then you gotta go through your whole team again to unequip the useless blade to get your faves back on again. Anyway, we make our way deeper, and Nia has some troubling thoughts as she suddenly feels weaker. She then explains how Jin was the one who saved her, meaning that she looked up to him, and which is why she worked for him. Rex, being his goofball self, snaps her out of it, saying that this ain't the Nia he knows. And don't worry, I'm showing this for a reason. You what? So anyway, we finally make it to where the blade should be. However, these dead Guardian Eater thingos attack us. Yeah, sure is scary. And this battle goes on for so long, with Rex almost dying, when all of a sudden, Nia transforms. Yeah, you heard me, because she is actually a flesh eater. <laughs> What's that? How is that possible? Well it is, because Neo was actually a blade brought by the father to heal his daughter. However, when it didn't work, he fused his daughter with Nia. What? And she is here now to save Rex. And well, I'll let this scene do the talking. Thank you for helping me see. I love you, Rex. What? They actually did it! A Japanese game with a love confession! And she isn't the main girl! Oh joyous day! I can't wait for this- Nia, I love you too! Yes! I love you, and all you guys! <laughs> My goodness, this game is way too cheesy for me. Jeez. Now Nia is your blade, and holy moly, she's so good. The downside to this is that you have no draw mark for the other two blades that Nia had, but I personally liked using her for the only reason to heal myself now instead of relying on the CPU. No other reason at all. Uh. Get out. Anyway, just as we win, Rex is whisked away to the magical tree place in his head where he met Pyra. And he meets the actual Adam, who recognises his worth and says he is worthy to wield the third blade. And upon touching it, he sees visions of the world destroyed. And a really old man. And then the sword breaks. Wait. What? No matter, this has given Rex enough motivation to go forward and rescue Pyra. And not to mention he doesn't really need another blade since he has Nia. Naturally. Also in these visions was the place where Pyra was being held, and Morag works it out to be the titan right at the bottom of the world tree. And so they head towards it. Meanwhile we see Malos. Ah! Why are you running? 
somehow stealing Pyra's memories, which allows his core crystal to completely heal without the need of Elysium. He then takes the Omega Feta cheese to make some delicious pasta, but all of a sudden Rayquaza attacks him of its own accord. It seems that Pyra knew it had some auto defense features, which is why she came quietly since she knew it would attack them. But Malice is just way too powerful and goes in to reprogram it. Anyway, back at the bottom, we land on the Titan and slowly make our way up. And I mean slowly because this place has the other field skill issue. This time with jumping. Now unlike before where you just needed fire blades, you actually need this leaping ability. And I literally had none that I could use. So once again I meditated and found that Poppy has this at level 2. Now if you've been watching the footage, I never really used Poppy at all in the game. Which is why I never thought about this. And if I uh, didn't uh, meditate on it, I wouldn't know what to do. But in short, you gotta go to Argentum, buy these holy moly maracas, give them to Tora, and boom, it's all done. Also, by the way, while I was farming for more blades, I got this one for Zeke, and she's absolutely perfect for him. Blade Anyway, we run into the overpowered Malos, who can obliterate matter with his dark energy. However, this time, we have Nia, who's like super duper good at healing. She then destroys Malos' body by super regenerating his cells, and so he falls to his death. Oh wait, his body isn't there. I sure hope this doesn't mean anything in JRPGs. No. Also, here is where I found that you can easily practice the more intense combo trees that I mentioned in part 1. But then there are also these super duper strong enemies. Level 100? What the heck? That's it, I'm out of here. Wait, 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 his, his blade. Uh, okay then. Bye! Anyway, we finally make it to the top of the Titan, to where Pyra is. Pyra! Pyra! But oh no, it's Malos. You're alive! Gee, who could have seen that coming? Naturally. Rex now grown up, and well, with Mia's help, instead of crying, man's up to fight Malos. And so we go and do that. <laughs> But, well, Malos gets annoyed at Nia always healing us, which reminds me of another JRPG. And so Jin freezes Nia, leaving us vulnerable. And then Super Anime Boy comes charging at us. This energy is incredible. Pyra and Mithra tell Rex to give up on them, and that the only reason they wanted to go to Elysium was to destroy themselves to pay for what they did during the war. But Rex the goody goody says, lol no, I made a promise to take you there myself, and I'm a man of my word. And so the two show themselves to him in front of this absolutely amazing mech, and join forces to bring out the third blade. And, and, and what? Are you kidding? Pyra and Mithra fuse together to make another blade? With green hair and a ponytail? <laughs> what? And so Ramses couldn't handle all the waifus in this game. And thus, we shall never know the end to this story. Or you will in part 3 because this took so long to edit. Oh, that's great. See you soon with... Rex, you're a guy. Don't tell me you haven't noticed that Mithra is lacking a little something. What? Answer carefully, Rex. Huh? Don't look at me, Rex, buddy. <laughs> you're on your own. Come on, Mithra. Isn't it time you got a new outfit? A few moments later. Wow! Wait, you cheated, Mithra. No free DLC skins allowed. But why? A few moments later. I don't even know what's happening with this game anymore. That's not what I'd call it. Now that's comedy.
Okay, let me just check my comments real quick. Where is Mark Park 3? I hope you're happy now. No. So hi to any new viewers. This is, surprisingly, the third and final part to my Xenoblade Chronicles 2 review. So if you wanna get caught up, uh, just to click the card up here, or description, or the pinned comment, and uh, you should be uh, fine. Because from this point onwards, this is end game content. Like, uh, huge big spoilers will be in this video, and I'm doing my best to warn you, okay, okay, okay? No. Alright then, here we go! So Pyra and Mithra fuse back into their true form, a green-haired ponytailed blade called... And she replaces Nia in the party, both literally and romantically. Get out. We then get the most anime cutscene ever, where Rex has now ascended. Impossible! I don't get it! But I'm not complaining! I mean, this one quote can just summarize the entire game. This is too ridiculous for words! We then corner Jin, who tells us to end him. But Rex the goody goody says, lol no. All I want to do is go to Elysium, just like, uh, move, uh, move a little aside so I can get through. Malos, however, interrupts them by saying he can't allow Rex to do that, since he wants to get there first, to awaken the strongest machine ion, to destroy the world and the architect. Indeed! He then calls up Rayquaza, who he had reprogrammed earlier, to destroy them. But Siren, Mithra's other pet, joins to fight it. And they accidentally destroy the whole platform, sending everyone tumbling into the clouds below. <coughs> Mithra wakes up next to Rex, who has been separated from the others, and are now in this strange apocalyptic world under the sea. I told you the geography of this game was pretty neat. Indeed! Rex and Mithra then joke around for a bit. Rule 5 of the Salvager Code. Always be. I don't think we need to hear it. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Hey! Before setting out to find the others. Also, by the way, with this new green power, Rex is able to overwrite controls of blades bonded to the other characters and use them for himself. I know it's the game's way of letting me survive down here in case I didn't have my own other blades, but it didn't really feel right. Was it like that for anyone else? That they couldn't remove the blades once they bonded with the other characters? Because it kind of just felt a bit wrong to my game's personal story? I don't know, man. I'm I'm getting too sentimental. Sorry, old man. Rex then tells Mithra what happened while she was gone, and we then get the title of the video. Which one of you is it in that form? It's not one or the other. It's both at once. Like coffee with milk? What kind of a... Pyra, Mithra, they're both me. Call me whichever. Oh. Oh no, oh no, oh no, how will I choose? I mean, you already know my answer if you watch part one, right? You can transform at will. If I need to. I see. <laughs> what? I kind of preferred your hair in that form. And let it be known, Rex is a man of culture, and we share a kindred spirit. But jerk. We then see Jin getting beat up by this zombie thing, but he is too weak to continue, and Rexy boy pitches in to help out. We knock it over, but like, uh, it's a zombie, duh, it comes back to attack. And all of a sudden, Bridget jumps in to save the day, saying to destroy their core crystals to keep the zombie down. And she is joined by Poppy and, oh uh, no, not him. Rex. Rex then asks Mithra to heal Jin. Fine, whatever. And due to JRPG nonsense, this is the power of the Master Blade. She can analyze other blades and as such, finds out that Jin is in fact a flesh eater with a human heart. And I know it's like meant to be shocking, but after Nia and Fusion Girl over here, I don't think anything can top that. We then get little bits of info dump here and there. Jin reveals that this is the land of Moritha, a place where humans lived but destroyed even before the Cloud Sea was born. 
form, and also the birthplace of the architect. Then Mithra deduces that the heart inside Jin is that of dear sweet Laura, his old master. Mithra and Poppy then have a little philosophical chat, as you do, where Mithra notes that no matter which age, humanity's reliance on technological advancement always backfires on them. This scares Poppy who's like, you know, an artificial blade. You know, technological advancement. She worries that she might someday destroy humanity, and makes Mithra promise her that if that should happen, to destroy her. Mithra agrees only in turn if she does something for her later on, and so the promise is made. The group then make their way further along until they come across the remains of the Torna Titan. Yes, the one that sunk during the war. The one which Jin and Laura were a part of. But no time for that, because it's the Three Musketeers. Just a little, just a little bit. <sighs> and Malos, who drive their ship down into the sea to find Jin. Back to the main group, we get another big spoonful of info dump. We find the womb of the Titan with all of these dead blades, which then leads Jin to explain the life cycle of core crystals. Okay. So Titans create core crystals inside them, which later turn into blades. But over time, eventually, instead of a blade returning to crystal, they get reborn as a Titan, with no memories of being a blade. The people people of Torna thought this was sacred, and the humans on top lived together in peace with the blades. And after a bit more exploring, which involved me getting a little overconfident in handling monsters without my healer near, Ow! Jin then reveals the shocking truth, but like, it started to get pretty obvious already, that after Pyra and Adam disappeared, it wasn't their battle with Malos that destroyed Torna, oh no, it was, you guessed it, a Malthus and Indol. He's just a little bundle of evil, ain't he? Naturally. So he sent Indol to attack Torna, which is how Laura actually died, and with her last breath, she tells Jin what humans fear the most, it's not death, Rather, it's being forgotten. And Jin refusing to forget her when he goes back into crystal form, fuses with her, taking her heart to become a flesh eater. However, the group's info dump is yet again interrupted by the zombies, this time with a boss. The rest of the group managed to find us though, and we all defeat it, only for Rex to find out. Uh... Wait, 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 is that a human ID card on the monster? Boy, you better hope you remember that for the ending. But why? So the group discuss that the best way to proceed is to climb the world tree right from its roots. But the three goofballs have other ideas. Ugh. As they come in to pick Jin up and also, uh, try to destroy our heroes. Are you kidding me? Jin, however, stops them and he tells them to just take him to the top of the tree. Well, that's not very nice. We could have used the lift too, guys. Ugh, guess we gotta go the long, hard way. It's world tree climbing time. What an odd thing to say. So we enter the world tree, which is in fact not really a tree, but it's a huge metal structure that had plant life growing around it. And if you're anything like me, who loves sci-fi over fantasy, <laughs> yeah, these next scenes are so good. Okay. Now after some real good dungeon, uh, climbing, fighting all these cool robotic sci-fi enemies, we then get a flashback to Amalthus' childhood where he and his mother were being pursued. His mother hid him, and when he came to, Amalthus found the men with his mother's lifeless body, and so he proceeded to kill the attackers. Curse those fools! We then cut to Ginny old boy on their ship, when suddenly, the end old titan comes charging out of the sea. It seems that Amalthus too now wants to reach the top, and thus attacks Jin's ship. Gee, everyone sure seems to love this hunk of tree, eh? Probably. Cutting back to us, we get the warning. Well, yeah, that's pretty obvious. Oh, my cookie supply was just running out. Oh no! Also, since we have Nia as a blade again, we get to some uh, new dialogue. Hey, Cutting Nia! Closes. About that thing you said that one time. Did you I, uh, say that? Well. Huh? Oh, right. <laughs> You're asking now. Now's not the time. We can talk later. So we make it outside to the next part of the tree to then see the big battle with Jin and Amalthus. Um, uh, l let me just grab some food and, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Yes. Oh, sweet, merciful architect. 
naturally. So Amalthus spots us, and thinking we still don't know his little schemes, he sends his messengers to tell us to attack Jin for him. Rex says, lol no, and uh, attacks the messengers, which in gameplay terms means he kills them, so uh, well, just uh, ignore that little detail. Uh -huh. Jerk. Anyway, Amalthus is mad that we didn't listen and reveals the not so big shock that he absorbed half of Fan Lenorn's crystal to become a blade eater like Zeke. This gives him her power to subdue other blades, including Mithra. Mithra! Mithra! Pyra! Using her, he summons Siren to destroy Jin, but Mithra manages to hold him off so the blast doesn't destroy the ship. Jin and Malos then make it to the top, leaving the three goofballs Ugh. to defend the ship since they are flesh eaters, meaning that they can't be controlled by Fan's power. Her mouth is still mad, keeps his hold on Mithra, but guess old Gramps decides to once again be late with his advice, now telling Rex since he's the driver of the Aegis, he can also wield amazing power. So Rex summons a huge beam of light, which seems to be coming from this structure shaped like an Aegis Core Crystal, to free Mithra from Amalthus' control. He then gets even more grumpy, and uses his Aegis Driver power, because he was Malice's driver remember, so he gets all this crazy power too, to summon more Ardane's Titan to attack the group. This is too ridiculous for words! We then get another flashback, gee this game sure loves to do that right now, where we see a mouth is traveling and the game is pretty much now trying to shove as many things as it can to tell you the player that this dude Amalthus he's a bit of an angry man who hates humanity naturally back to the present we see more Ardane's Titan shoot a massive beam of energy just missing the group Alphonse on top is shocked to learn that his Titan is being controlled by someone else majesty we strayed off course but we managed to confirm our current position where are we look That's... Really? Did you just somehow miss the giant tree right in your view? Uh, anyway, amongst all of this commotion, which includes the Aussie's Titan arriving at the scene, and Ugboy Ugh. sending the other two onto the tree for safety. Petroka! I love you. You are so gross, Mick! Gee, this game really hates love stories. I love you, and all you guys. Get out. Blondie here then transforms his ship into a mech, yeah, stick with me, to then beat up Indol's Titan. I don't get it, but I'm not complaining. At which point, Blondie reveals to Amalthus that they both are the same, both being blade eaters. What? And that long ago, he was one of the refugees that Amalthus healed back in the day, but managed to escape getting killed during Amalthus' murderous ragey days. Amalthus getting really mad again, calls upon Zeke's homeland titan to now help out. Say, so yeah, 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 you pretty much have uh, every single uh, country here fighting this one mech. Also, the voice acting is still... Ah... Uh... I can't back down from. God, this game is so cheesy. Jeez. So Rex works out that the big green energy beam on Indol is a source of Amalthus' power, and that they need to destroy it. Mithra says, Boy, we ain't close enough for that. But don't worry, the furball Tora can finally help. Yeah, he was a bit quiet these past few hours. Tora have no idea. By using Poppy's limited booster to fly them closer. Or you know she could transform into that ability that was stronger but never used again in the story because Tora is a dumb sack of potatoes. What? So to get closer. Closer, they gotta go up. And well, as you can see, the enemies get a bit tougher. Out of juice! And uh, because they're a little bit tougher, I uh, can give you a little hint if you want to avoid the enemies. First, you run between its legs, get into the next zone, realize you're screwed, then jump off. Ah! Because this will then spawn you at the elevator behind the mech. Slow and steady, eh? Sex. <laughs> I see! We reach the edge and Poppy launches us towards Indol, where the Aegis destroys the pillar and we somehow survive, but oh no, it's still alive. What was the point of that whole segment then? I don't believe this. No matter, Blondie comes in to sacrifice himself and we get a little flashback as to how Laura and Jin saved him before his ship blows up. Rest in peace, my favorite voice line in the entire game. <sighs> 
Ugh. Now at this point, I thought, you know what would be amusing? Why, traveling to the Titans to do some side quests. As this definitely is not because the game locks you out again of the main story, unless you have the field skill focus like the past two times. No. I'm not mad. But anyway, it's still pretty funny going around these countries that are locked in battle while Rex is over here like... Why? Witness my power, all of you! Was that it? Indeed! Also to fans of the first part of this series, remember how I swore vengeance on that bird that destroyed me in that part? Well, I got my anime redemption arc. Why? So we get enough focus to go through the door and onto the skywalk of the tower. We finally make it to where Jin is waiting for us at his last stand, knowing he's still too weak from before, but deciding to see whether the world and destiny will favor us or Malos. Wait, in the cutscene, Jin questions us to why we want to go to Elysium to share the land with everyone. Because if that happens, humans will still turn it to Torna or even Moritha, as is their nature. Rex promises that won't happen as he'll stop any unrest. But Jin questions him. What happens when you die? Who will continue your ideals? And Rex smartly says, isn't that the same as Blades? Even when humans die, their message and memories live on in others, just like Blades. Jin then collapses and the two goofballs come in and ask Nia to heal him. And while well, that's happening, all of a sudden, the true villain of the whole game appears. Yes, it's the stalker dude from part two. <laughs> Oh right, no, no, it's a Malthus in this crazy form, which he got by absorbing core crystals. This was achieved as his role as the Praetor, which allowed him access to a whole bunch of these crystals. He then starts ranting on and on about how he's the Architect's agent and how the Aegis's goal is to destroy the world. Pyra and Mithra then realize that Malos was influenced by him when a Malthus summoned him. That is the reason why Malos kind of wants to destroy humanity. It was all due to a Malthus. We then do battle with Tentacle Man and win, but of course Amalthus is a greedy little boy and fuses with the tree to finish us off. Jin however turns on his anime charm and saves us by impaling Amalthus and the angry man finally disappears, seeing his mother one last time. Jin having used up all of his Super Saiyan energy also dissolves, but not before having told us to stop Malos. What a splendid soul you were, Jin. Gee, guess you're gonna ignore all those people he killed, eh, Gramps? I did not know. And so we reach the final chapter, which weirdly shows us the past on board this orbiting structure in space, which is under attack. Oh no! In a last ditch effort to save the space elevator, Command gives authority to use the final weapon Ion. However, they can't access the room as a scientist named Klaus is there, experimenting on creating a universe. Oh no! He feels that this is the only way to stop the war. We see this structure also resembling the one that Rex drew his power on from earlier, and so pushing away a female scientist who has a badge eerily similar to the one Rex found in Moritha. Wait, what? Klaus presses the button. Earth is then seemingly destroyed in the same vision Rex had when he touched the third blade, and a new universe is born. We then see Malos meeting the supposed architect, a feeble old man, also from Rex's vision. The man reveals that everything Malos has done he already knows, which then prompts Malos to try and kill him, which hilariously fails. Ooh. The architect says, lol, don't worry, I'll be dead soon anyway, don't worry. Malos then says, thanks dad for making me, and proceeds on ahead. Our group right behind. Huh. Whoa! makes it to the top, which shockingly to me, is at the top of the space elevator, similar to the one from that cutscene. And oh my goodness, it's, it's beautiful. I honestly will say that this game's world design is my all-time favorite. I love how at the start of this game you wander around these huge titans feeling so insignificant, and yet here you are, looking down on the whole world in one go. I just really like sci-fi stuff, okay? I get it now. The group then hears bells, which is what Rex and Pyra heard in their window XP dream, and so they head there. But instead of rolling green hills, they see a vast desert with run 
down buildings and dust billowing. Exploring around, the group finds remnants that people actually lived here, and that the size is easily big enough to fit everyone from all of the continents below. It should be Elysium, but it isn't. Eventually, they reach a chapel where the bell tolled. They hear the architect's voice calling out for them, and well, trusting a creepy old man's voice is the best thing in this situation, so down they go. It's made of same substance as World Tree itself. Same as the World Tree. Huh? Hey! Where is everyone? Rex then suddenly finds himself all alone, being transported to their old memories, where we see Nia looking really angry. How do you explain this? She spouts out hateful comments that they were misled to this wasteland, all trusting Rex. We fight them, then find Morag and Bridget, who say similar things, and after that fight, we find the others and fight them. Now I know this is meant to be very scary and profound, finding all of your friends seemingly turn their backs on you, but uh, Rex has a bit of a habit of uh, ruining the mood. He then finds himself at the beginning of the game, where Gramps mutters how pointless this whole world is, after which Rex is transported to his hometown, where he sees... Oh lordy! Jerk. But even this vision seems a bit strange, as Mithra is now nice to him like Pyra, and Pyra scolds him like how Mithra does. Seemingly in all this and everyone acting very odd, Rex breaks down and cries. Which, given what I said in the earlier parts, makes so much sense. Rex is still just a kid. I want to mention this because I remember seeing things online while playing, at how everyone hated Rex for being a wimpy protagonist and such, but you have to remember that the game tells you over and over, he's just a fish out of water, a salvager, a kid. This is honestly too much for him, and I really love this scene and how it was built up over the entire game. Pyra seeing his distress asks her father to stop the trial, and we suddenly are with everyone all normal, as it seems Seems like they all were undergoing similar trials. The architect then says that he was trying to test our strength of our hearts before revealing to us the big shock that he is in fact Klaus, that scientist from that flashback who wanted to make a new universe. What? And just as he decides to give us one big ol' info dump, I get interrupted in my playthrough and hit pause. Then, while still reeling from the events, when I resume, I pressed A to resume. But for whatever reason, A is to skip cutscenes. What? No, I'm not joking. I skipped one of the biggest cutscenes in the game by accident. Oh no. Which of course meant that I was so baffled after this and throughout the ending. But don't worry, dear viewer. I'm here for you. The game has a cutscene viewer. Oh, that's great. So in his research to find hope for humanity, Klaus discovered parallel universes. I don't get it, but I'm complaining. And thus, by opening the conduit, he wanted to connect the gate to them, in the hope of changing his own war-torn universe. Instead, what happened was that when he opened the conduit, everything in this universe was sent out to the other dimensions, and all that remains here is this universe, the land of Moritha, and the right half of his body. What? Klaus bemoans that this state of him is being punished for what he tried to do, so to try and seek forgiveness, he sets about trying to fix the world. First was to create a substance that can restore or dissolve matter, which then became known as the Cloud Sea. This then set about destroying the remains of Moritha, which led Klaus to create life with the core crystals, who held data on all life forms from the old universe. The crystals mixing in with the sea created the Titans, and eventually evolutions made humans. Now Klaus knew, as humanity always did, was to destroy itself, so he made the Aegises, three of them, Ontos, Logos, and Numa. Ontos was lost to another dimension, Logos became Malos, and Numa became Pyra and Mithra. It boggles the mind, Detach. But over time, Klaus learnt that humanity were doing the same things as the humans before. They were seeking answers for why things happen like they do, like with young Amalthus. And even when Amalthus stole the crystals and Malos was destroying the world, he just watched, because he lost the will to even try, knowing his redemption was just a failure. What? He also says that once he eventually fades away, the conduit will vanish, making the Aegis lose its power forever. I don't get it at all. 
Peep, 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 peep. What? But in all that, he notes that Rex's reawakening Pyra is different to humans before. And while we are all spellbound by this info, Malhus begins his crazy fun antics of destroying the world with other sirens. Oh joy! Klaus then gives Pyra all the authorization to use Elysium to stop Malos. And just as we leave, Rex says, Thank you for giving us all life. We make it further in and see Malos destroying the Titans as he prepares to wake up Ion, the strongest artifice. So one last boss rush run and we are here. The good old JRPG save point before everything changes. The last call to do every side quest you want because once you beat the game, it will only load you back here. And as you'll see, the end can be a little bit crazy. Indeed! So we reach Malos still his arrogant self, but confronting him, we learn that instead of Malos being influenced by a Malthus, it was actually Jin who drove his evil desire. As when he met him, Jin had lost all his will to live, but he couldn't die, because he had Laura's memories. This spurred Malos on, hating the world that did this to Jin. He then awakens Ion in a surprisingly well voiced scene. Show me why you're here in this world! That huge mech from Rex's vision comes to life for the final battle. And it's a, a weird final battle. You attack him with the slow pace of the gameplay as usual. But then at times he moves back and summons these mini bosses from before. Meaning you lose all your power build up when you fight the new enemies. You what? We then get a cutscene where Rex tells Malos of Jin's final words, and that he never actually wanted to die. That because Malos reached out to him, he wanted to connect with Malos. And how many people died because of it? You'd forgive him just like that? Forgiving isn't that easy. Well, it helps that Jin is a sexy anime ninja, so forgiving him was pretty easy, eh? With everything you've done, we can't forgive you. I get it now. I don't get it at all. And with more battling, we defeat Ion, slicing it in two. This then causes the conduit to disappear, and with Klaus, he leaves one final gift as he moves on. The sirens that were attacking the Earth stop, and we see Malos dying, finally being able to find his meaning to his destructive existence. Huh? But of course, with a giant space elevator, with no power, it kinda stops uh, working. And this is catastrophic as the huge structure starts to collapse, and we get a little physics lesson, where the rings would fly off into space due to centrifugal force, but the world tree itself would crash down on Earth, most likely destroy the entire planet. What? Rex pleads with Numa for a way to save everyone. She hesitates, but says yes, there is one way. She leads us to a place where we can fire boosters to change the tree's trajectory to miss hitting the planet. Numa then calls upon Gramps and Poppy to stay behind while she tells them something. And so down we run to the booster. But suddenly, Numa stops on the other side, then destroys the bridge. She says to Rex that it was all a lie. The booster thing doesn't exist. All all there is are escape pods, and that the only way to stop this is to destroy the tree with Ion, which in turn means sacrificing herself. This breaks Rex's heart and he tries everything to get back over to the other side, including pleading with Poppy to fly over. Poppy says she can't as this fulfills the promise Mithra made to her in Moritha. Everyone then tells Rex that he should listen to Numa and that this is what it means to be an adult, to let go. And so Rex finally agrees, finally becoming a man. Numa then removes her crystal from Rex and... Pyra! Oh, you were so close, game, so close to getting that emotion. Pyra! He and the others escape in the pods while Numa wakes up Ion to finish off the tree. Pyra! Pyra! However, the pods break up while going back to Earth. And guess what? Gramps finally does something good, turning into his titan form, somehow, and saves everyone. And while they go down, they see the cloud sea disappearing, and no titans, with seemingly everyone dead? I don't get it at all. But then in a flash of light, they are over a vast ocean, and the titans are all there, merging into one huge landmass. This is Klaus's final gift, 
creating the world once more, making a new Elysium down here. And then after the credits are over, the Aegis Crystal in Rex's hand starts to glow. And as every other blade before, out comes Pyra and Mithra, both separated but very much alive. And thus, boy meets girl. Or girls, since now there are two of them. And Nia, I guess as well, who still didn't get her happy ending. I love you and all you guys. I simply got a little crush. Thus we conclude Xenoblade Chronicles 2. An absolutely amazing JRPG that has the best world design I have ever seen. Like I'm not even joking about me thinking years ago. Just what would happen if we as humans built a space elevator? And I guess thanks to this game, that's a bad idea. But this was such a fun JRPG. RPG. And it's kind of amusing to me that this was the game I saw at Nintendo's E3 one year and was so confused as to what I was seeing. But after its glowing praise on release, I'm glad I bought this, even though the stories and characters were dumb and silly at times. And with some really humorous voice direction, <coughs> the charm and cheerful nature of the game held it together. Plus, I mean the added bonus of waifu blades. My goodness, Monolith, you've struck gold with this format. Jerk. So now we can only look forward to the future and hope to see just what kind of crazy sci-fi nonsense the team can create. Next up we have Jin from Anime Ninja Land competing in the gold medal match for Long Jump. <laughs> this game is top quality everyone. Now that's comedy. Well here we are, it's the golden experience, Xenoblade style. So for those not in the know, this game was made after Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but takes place 500 years before its story, which means we ain't got our racing car boy anymore. As here, our main character is Laura with her blade Jin. Also I will mention you might want to check out my videos on Xenoblade 2 beforehand, as I won't be repeating things that I mentioned there. But then again, reviewers said that this game is apparently standalone. So... Are you really sure about that? Not really. Okay, so this game starts out on the Torna Titan, where Jin and Laura are under attack by some big boy. And the first thing you will notice is that we can finally control the blades. Oh, a feature that would have been so amazing in the main game is now a big selling point here. I'll get into it later on when we got more characters. Give me a chance too. I mean, hey, sure, you can attack if you want to, matey. But for now, these two travel through the area till they come across a burnt village with one lone surviving boy. My name is... Ugh. I see. And thus, we got a brand new party member, with many different skills and ability. Oh wait, no. He's an NPC, he doesn't help us in battles at all. How sad. We then get some boring political stuff for this game's Praetor some guy. Then cutting back to our main duo, who discuss some things at a campsite. I'll get into it a bit later on, but let's just say, these areas are a little bit glitchy. The two reveal how they are part of a mercenary group, and that they should report the burnt village to their leader the next day, while meeting up with another blade called Hayes, who is helping Laura search for her lost mother. But when they get to the said meeting spot, they find it destroyed by what looks to be Malos, an all-powerful evil Aegis blade accidentally released into the wild by this totally good guy. It's almost like ass. What the? And I guess it's a perfect time for our first boss battle against one of Malos's mechs. Well, I meant perfect time in a metaphorical sense. Oomph. But we are saved by the supposed hero of the people and his blonde simpleton. This is Adam, who is the Prince of Torna, alongside Mithra, the other Aegis Blade. Like the Yang to Malos's Yin. And well, I guess My? Jin is kind of a stolen blade, as the previous owner before Laura had stolen his core crystal. So guess we are the bad guys and they try to take us in. You! Huh? 
That last attack looks behind it last it's absurd. Huh? I really, really like you two. Um Sir Oh no, it's a new character. A little fox boy. I'm sure I will enjoy his character growth very much in the entire story. What is that? Sad tale. Oh, here we go again. So after wowing them two with our strength, they have a chat with us. Adam agrees to not turn us in about the stolen blade Jin if we join him in taking down Melos. I mean, hey, sure, why not? But before that, uh, can we make a quick stop in finding my mother? No, you know what I am, right? Lacking in compassion. Huh? So this turns into a running theme with the game. Mithra is made out to be, well, an idiot. And now while I disagree with a lot of it, like there are times in the game when no one is talking, then one of them will go, Oi, Mithra, stop being so mean. And she's like, oh, wait, wait, what did I do? In this game, the other characters really pile it on her, saying how she's just a dumb blade who doesn't understand humanity. I know the game is trying to do those, you know, personality growth things, but the thing is, well... She's like that at the start of the main game. So from this fact, I know she isn't going to change much, so I don't honestly see why everyone bullies Mithra. It makes for a good video title though. Jerk. But Hayes chimes in saying she's found Laura's mother in Torigoth, and thus we head there. While some creep, uh creeps on us. And yes to you smart viewer, this is the dude who stole Jin's core crystal and who abused Laura and her mother a while ago. So I guess he's going to be a bad guy in this game. Just a hunch. What? I'm getting sharper. Keener. That's interesting. And so we reached Torogoth and found uh it's all burnt down, and deeper in we find a cemetery with one of the graves having a charm Laura made for her mother. But while leaving, the group is surrounded by Ardanian soldiers, and we meet Bridget once more who does battle with us. She is the royal blade, and for one so high and mighty, she, uh, well, joins in on the Bully Mithra campaign. Ugh, come on! That was a pretty cheap trick. Cheap, you say? Don't be absurd. It's called tactics, look it up. But perhaps that's something a simpleton like yourself could never hope to comprehend. Ugh. A simpleton? Hayes, however, uses her OP pause any blade attack thing that she rarely uses in the story again to stop the fighting. And Emperor Alphonse comes in with his other blade, Aegeon. And yes, this is Emperor Alphonse from Fire Emblem Heroes, not to be confused with Alphonse from Xenoblade 2 or Alphonse from Fire Emblem Heroes. Yes. Anyway, Alphonse is buddies with Adam, somehow, and invites us back to his flagship. Yeah, there it is. Laura and Hayes stay back as Laura wants more time alone with her mother. And so we cut back to Indol time. You know, the big high and mighty religious place that controls everyone. Where we see young Amalthus, who is definitely not evil, and some other creepy dude. Like seriously, you don't design a character like this and not expect him to be the bad guy. Indeed. They discuss things like how core crystals contain DNA on all beings, blades eventually turn into titans, mind boggling, or i.e. things that you already know from the main game. Indeed. And we cut back to the ship, as the game can't get enough of the good boy definitely not evil Amalthus, with another flashback to when Mithra and Adam first met him. And she's a woman too. Quite lovely indeed. Oh great, I guess since we don't have Gramps here, some other old man has to take the pervy role, eh? You. You! So we see the plot device of leave characters off screen, so then we have to rush in to save them. As Aegeon, who by the way is literally the most bland designed main blade I've ever seen in my life. What? Running in to tell us that some evil looking dudes were approaching the cemetery. And we rush out to Laura and Hayes, who are under attack by the old one-armed creeper from before, who has an Aussie accent. I had a soft spot for her. Making it very apparent that he hasn't forgiven Jin for cutting off his arm from last time. Well, uh, <laughs> you know the drill. Win the battle, but lose in the cutscene. And when all hope is lost, Jin comes anime charging in and chops off both of his arms. 
and when he goes for the kill, Laura stops him, letting the Aussie escape as she doesn't want him to die in front of her mother's grave. We return to the flagship. While the Aussie trips over, unfortunately for him, landing right near the Eye Man, who has some hankering for some illegal testing. Stop it! And now we have Alphonse and his two blades joining our party. Wait. What? I guess this is a good time to go over the combat for the game. And for what it's worth, the combat is the best part of the game. It takes the same overall mechanics of the main story, so initiate combat, then auto attack while building up meters for the special attacks, which you press buttons when they're full. But the difference here is, firstly, you don't get the blade Pokemon system. These are the only blades you bond with, which of course means different things for the orb tree. So in the main game you had to pick the right blade elements to then work your way up this tree, with level 1 being the meter on the right, then level 2 and so on with your party members. But here, there's no tree, and the game rewards you the same for any combination of elements. Thus, when the party gauge is full, you can do an all out attack, picking an element to defeat the orb types here. And if you destroy an orb you get another round, and so just piling on the damage. Now another feature is controlling the blades. Laura gets Jin and Hayes, Adam gets Mithra, and Alphonse gets Bridget and Aegeon. So with the D-pad you can swap them out in battle, which attacks the enemy, while also refilling your attacks on the right. You will want to keep doing this in each battle, which also makes the combat way more engaging and hands-on than the main game. I prefer this style so much more, and kind of wish they could somehow patch this into the main game. Because after controlling the blades here, you can see what you're missing with the main game when you have so many blades to choose from. And then I guess, the other mechanics are mostly the same, like upgrading your weapons and abilities, and yes, you have to go into the field skill tree to make sure unlocks for use, but however, thankfully, there is no gating the story with field skills like in the main game. Instead you have the dreaded side quest system. Oh no. So in this game, there is this thing called community. And it opens up every single time you talk to someone, just please stop. Yes, I know you can turn it off in the settings. You don't mean it. So with that, it doesn't mean anything. Yep, it's pointless. Know what you should look out for is the side quest people, and talking to them unlocks their side quest. Doing it will make the person very happy to join your community. And if you have enough of these people happy, then your rank goes up. Now why is this a big deal, you may be asking? Well, let's just say you're playing through the main story, not really focusing on these. All of a sudden, the game will roadblock you saying, Hey buddy, you need community quest level 2 to continue. I guess you could look at it as a way of the game telling you to play the side content, but you know, it's pointless forced padding to a short game to make it feel longer than it really is. Wow, I can't believe it. I'm sorry, I always seem to have some big issue with these games, and this seriously was the biggest one. By forcing the player to do these side quests to proceed with the main story, you kind of stop caring about the side content. I mean, most of them aren't even voiced. So when you're forced to do them to get to the main story back to back, you kind of just speed run them. My advice would be to do as many side quests as you can on your journey, otherwise you'll have so much to do back to back with no end in sight. Also, one other thing I want to mention is the campsite. Here is where you can rest and level up with bonus XP, but also where you craft items and such which you will need for side quests. However, there is this thing called the chat. Thing, I don't know what it's called. Which I honestly did not use mostly because the scenes were not voiced. Yeah, what can I say? I love my dumb English dubs, okay? Hey, are you angry? I'm not. That's interesting. Me? Malice enough. Ugh, you think this is bad? Just stick around for a bit. Also, I was kind of scared to visit them after the game literally crashed on me when visiting one. Yeah, it's not letting me do anything, okay? <laughs> what? Anyway, we go back to the story, with some little bits here and there, kind of showing how Adam is worried about Mithra, as she has this crazy power within her, but doesn't think she can control it. Just, uh, mentioning that for later. Next to each other like that? You really do look like twins, you two. 
So we arrive back in Torna, when a soldier warns us that Malos plans to attack the capital. How did this lowly soldier know that? Who knows? All I know is we got a long journey ahead of us because of this boss. Well, that's the end of my review, everyone. Titan's foot. I almost had a heart attack. I don't even know what to say to that. Okay, but with the boss battle, the game introduces another character whose name is Minoth. Oh wait, uh, who's Minoth? Uh, okay, am I meant to know? Oh! It's him! Mr. Coughing Man! <laughs> You've got an interesting way of fighting. Don't you know? His hope caused this. Or his despair. Despair? Oh, come on! And I guess after defeating the boss, it's Milton's time to show why the devs created him. His sole purpose of being in the game. I make sure you get enough to eat. What? I don't know where you put all that. I'm the Aegis. I need all the fuel I can get. Hey! Where are my extra rations? Brilliant, amazing. A character purely created to bully Mithra. <laughs> yeah, I don't like him very much if you can't tell. Really? But we cut back to good, not evil Amalthus and his mate No Eyes, who brought the Aussie back with him and is like, yeah, alright, let's just test something on him. I'm sure this won't come up in the game ever again. Liar! So moving on with the group, they arrive at Hyber Village, a place where Jin finds his old diary, as Blades sort of lose their memory every time their owner dies, so writing in a diary is a good way to remember things. And in it, he finds a photo of his old driver, Laura comes in and, uh, well, acts very out of character. I am who I am. I do not change. Uh. Laura, you okay? What happened? Uh. You, you got me right here. My heart's pounding! What? No reaction. What the hell is that? And this then at night, we get a scene that definitely hasn't been done before. Oh, you're such a pain in everyone's bum, you know that, you simpleton. Amazing. <laughs> really? Then after crossing a harmless desert... <laughs> this all feels familiar, doesn't it? Indeed. We arrive at the capital, which looks down on the whole torn and titan. Adam notes how this is actually safety lock titan, as when the crystal is in this tower, the titan is peaceful, but before, it was a huge destructive monster, blowing up other titans. Gee, what a convenient thing to say, Adam. I wonder why you didn't mention this beforehand. And so we meet with the Tornin King, who asks our group to be the guards for the tower against Malos' attacks. We agree, and what amazing timing! Malos and his buddy Mechs attack the capital, and so we have a mini boss rush mode, after which we finally meet the main villain. Hello, partner. He has an awesome presence. If this is a joke, it's not funny. And I guess we have been pumping them iron since our last death, and we easily win. We can take them on a bit later. Hey, sure, Laura. We definitely will fight him later while, you know, he's nuking the city. What about it? And so we beat Malos in gameplay, but lose to him in the cutscene, as he escapes on his mech. And while it looks like we might have to fight more of them, look who comes in to save us. Why, yes, it's Gramps. Knuckle! Wait, 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 wait. I thought his name was Gramps formerly a Zerda. Who the heck is Nuncle? Like, I'm sorry, wh why is no one else getting worked up on this? Am I the only one who cares about the lore for this creepy old dude? Womb? Yeah, it's a game. Gee, thanks for reminding me. That's interesting. 
And so we ride on Gramps, but are too late, as Malos T poses out with the crystal, going to the Titan head to awaken its dragon mode. But before that says, you know what? I'm having too much fun with you with this rodeo. I'll wait for you to arrive. So I guess instead of going there straight away, we chat to Gramps in the Titan womb. Womb? Which is where the blades are born. Were you born here too, Azurda? Wait, wait, wait. Now she calls him Azurda? And this wasn't mentioned in the game before? What about Nuncle? You can't just keep making up names for him. Uh, anyway. For doing good, Laura gets knighted for some reason, because we have plenty of time to do this while Malos just twiddles his thumbs over there. And then we have even more time to waste, because guess what? We are roadblocked unless we do some more side quests. And what side quest would those be? Oh, nothing. Thing, except for helping this disgusting nopon. What? Why? So after resting at an inn, because I'm tired from all these side quests, we decide to leave the kids behind. Oh, don't worry, you won't miss this perv. Oh. And thus we head on towards Malos, but like not before some dungeon crawling in a really well designed cave. I gotta hand it to them, they do make some really cool world design when they feel like it. So we make it to the top, and I guess this is the final battle. You know, the point in JRPG is when you finish the game it will load back here, which is a good place to throw up a finale spoiler warning because yes, no part 2 here, we're finishing this interesting game in one video. Anyway, moving on, we meet Malos who summons his mech to attack the Titan's core, to make it more mad. And after it goes dragon mode, Mithra summons her pet Rayquaza, but it like dies in one hit. Dragon types, am I right? No. So Mithra summons her other pet, Siren, while Malos summons his one, and we get a really cool battle where instead of a party gauge, doing attacks builds up this meter, and once full, our mech will attack his to just fill it quicker than Malos can. He, however, really just wants to see some mayhem, and sends his Siren to attack the capital, absolutely obliterating it, killing everyone there, including some kids we left behind. And well, Mithra had a thing for Milton's verbal and physical abuse, and cries out in anger, going berserk mode, and fights Malos super anime style. They both then pilot their own sirens, absolutely going nuts at each other, destroying more of the titan. Mithra however is still holding on, trying her hardest to not go crazy, but she then unleashes a huge attack that destroys Malos's siren, presumably killing him into the cloud sea. But you know he'll be back, of course he'll be back. INDEED! This attack however does massive damage to the titan, exploding its core. This almost kills our main party, if not for the brave Alphonse, who sacrifices himself to save us. Mithra falls unconscious onto Adam, and the flagship takes them to the survivors of the capital, where we see, Ugh. and Milton, with all Fox Boy dead. This despair causes Mithra to cry out, as she realises she was the cause of all these deaths, and seems to forget that Alphonse died as well, thus locks herself away in the weaker form of Pyra. We then get the farewells, as Adam says he's going to hide his sword and Pyra away, as they are way too powerful, while Hayes, Jin and Laura go the other way. Now this is where the game would end, but oh no, we get to see this. Yep, old No Eyes turned him into this blade human monster machine hybrid, and he's hell bent on destroying us. But we uh, easily defeat him. Which makes Laura finally happy that her mother can rest easy. Even though Jin could have solved this problem half a game ago. And back at Indol, we see happy scenes and peaceful activity as a Malthus calmly becomes an ex Praetor. Oh, he's definitely not an evil guy at all, everyone. Are you completely incapable of saying something without sarcasm. Sorry. His first decree is to send his force to attack Jin. Lovely. We then see Laura, Jin, Hayes, and Ugh. back in the forest as Jin looks back seeing Indol's forces come to kill them. We then cut back to Jin burning his group photo they took at that village, or Gramps asks him whether he'll see him again. Jin says, Lol, no. And we then see Rex finding Pyra, linking the game to the main story. Really? Okay, so before we bring the end spoiler skippers back, I have a few issues with that ending. 
So firstly, it just feels like the story here wasn't fleshed out as they wanted to. Like while playing the main game, I always thought that bit where Mithra destroys Torna as this crazy huge war event, you know, some epic crazy battle on a huge scale. But now it was just due to some fox boy dying. I don't get it at all. All right, anyway, okay, everyone's back here. So I will say I have a lot of issues with this game. I played Xenoblade 2 when this was released, and everyone online was praising it to no end. And I guess I got overhyped on it. A story that could have been worthwhile and added to the main game's plot. I mean, I love the main game, it's one of my all-time favourites, but this just felt a bit too rushed. I mean, looking back, I honestly would have rather this story not existing at all and let my imagination take over. And it's not like the game really warranted existing because it kind of was a bit short and they had to bloat it out with some padding of side quests. Of course, it could be also due to me missing the main party members and not really caring for these new characters. Especially since you know this is 500 years ago. All the humans in this game are dead by the time Rex comes in. You know that's going to happen. This situation kind of reminds me of a Reverse Tales game. As Zestiness was made first, then Berseria, which was a prequel to its world. But its story and gameplay were both huge improvements over Zestiness. So I kind of was hoping that a game like this would have been on that level of quality, but unfortunately it wasn't for me. The gameplay and music were standouts however. I do honestly wish this combat was updated to the main game, as I don't think I can go back with that slower style and not controlling the blades. But yeah, I guess I'm in the minority when I say this. I don't think this game is worth it, even if you are a fan of the main game. Unless you really, really love Jin and seeing Mithra getting bullied. Then yeah, if that's your thing, then I guess this game is for you. But if you've never played a Xenoblade game, ah. do not start here. Huh? I don't know why so many people said it's standalone. It is not. Play the main game first, then this one. Or watch my videos on it. Nah. I guess looking back, it could be a sign of fatigue on this style of gameplay. I mean, maybe I do need a break from these kinds of games, but then again, I really enjoy the stories these people tell. Man, if only there was another Xenoblade game that had a different style of gameplay, but still the amazing story and world building that the main game was known for. Oh well, maybe someday. Would you believe that this is a great summary of the entire game? Wait, what? Now that's comedy. Oh, Xenoblade X. That one expensive game I bought in 2017, but I probably should have just waited. A hundred thousand- Released on the Wii U, you know, when that was actually a thing, it got praises all around from the people who played it. All three of them. Now for me, technically, Xenoblade X was my first Xenoblade I knew about, except me back then never really paid much attention. However, after Xenoblade 2, I can honestly say, I love you Monolith. Aw, oh, that's great! Also, I do want to mention, if you were wondering why I was a bit more pessimistic on my Torna review, it can probably be explained because while I was writing that script, I was playing this game. Oh boy, was this the fresh air I needed in the series. Alrighty, let's start from the top. You get all these notifications and settings about the online and I'm like, wait a minute, the Wii U had online? Indeed. But I'll get to that later. The first cutscene starts up where it shows the Earth being bombarded by a war between two alien forces in the near future. Knowing the aliens were coming, Somehow. The humans sent giant ships into space with survivors, but the only one that made it through was the White Whale. And they fly safely as the Earth is destroyed. Ah, jeez, just getting straight to the point, eh? Everyone is gone. Oh no! Also, by the way, this is narrated by Morgana from Persona 5. I'll get into that soon enough, but the voice acting in this game was amazing. Seriously? The ship then spent two years adrift until, for whatever reason, Reason, the aliens came back again and attacked the ship, sending it crashing into a foreign planet, with the hull splitting off from the rest of the ship. And then we create our character. Wait, 
What? Well, yeah, that was news to me too. Uh, you don't get some British boy to control. No, you make your own. So I finally decided to create my channel mascot, Ramona. If you follow me on Twitter or Twitch, you would know who this is. Oh yeah? And I just want to point out, holy moly, the voice cast for this game is amazing. I can't believe I can make it sound like Chie, Velvet, or 2B. That's one thing you'll notice that's very different about this game from the other Xenoblades. The voice cast is actually well known, at least to me. But in those games, you don't really know any of the actors outside of that one game. I mean, Rex was a TV actor. Oh, I adore army humor, especially from such a good looking guy. But yes, as for Ramona's voice, I had to go with my favorite voice actress, good old 2B. You don't say. So we awaken on a dark and stormy night to see the other best girl in the game, Elma. She's a high ranking officer and finds us in this pod that launched from the hull of the ship and takes us back to the new base. This is where you get a first taste of the gameplay. It's a third person adventure game that is incredibly open world. I'll get into that later, but for now, we beat up some small enemies. And I say that because we die to the big ones. Oh yeah, don't let the level fool you. This isn't like most JRPGs. The size difference is what you should be most interested in. And for now, we are no match for these things. So we make it back to the hull, which is now called New Los Angeles. Because I guess the white whale launched from LA on the original Earth. And this is now the base for humans on this planet. We head in and meet up with two others, Irina and Yosuke. Wait, what? We then meet Morgana, I, I mean Lynn, who is an engineer, and will be one of the main characters in our party alongside Elma. She's 13. I didn't say anything. Apology accepted. Lynn takes us on a transportation ship to our new home, saying how new LA is divided into four distinct sections. Industrial for tech development, commercial for shops, housing for well. Housing, housing, and more housing and the main area, the administration section. We then meet the head honcho, some guy, I forget his name, and he gives us the whole rundown since the crash seems to have conveniently given us amnesia. Blade is an acronym. Builders of a legacy after the destruction of Earth. Quite fitting, I think. No, it just sounds really forced. Indeed. So he tells us that they created Blade to quickly establish a provisional government on this foreign planet and that their purpose is to search for the Lifehold Unit, a huge structure from the ship which has the rest of the civilians still in stasis. Even the way that they walk is so cool. Oh yeah, work it baby. Mm -mm -mm. She's 13. Actually, I, uh, I don't normally show this to people, but I've been working on some Skell fanfiction. Hold on, I'll just pull it up here one sec. This girl seriously is writing fanfic between two giant robots? Well, that's no different from real life, eh? <laughs> so these are the Skells. Pretty much these giant mechs the humans control to help with the rebuilding of the new home. Honey, we're home. <laughs> well, friend, what do you say? Can we count on you to do your part? Ms. Koo, Koo, how much do you know about life pods? You mean like from the white whale? Like the one Elma, a blade, rescued our friend here from. Emphasis on the word rescued. Because if you aren't released, you just sit there frozen in stasis forever. So did you have an engineering question about life pods? Or is this all part of the guilt trip? I'm sure I have no idea what you're talking about. Now what'll it be, friend? <clears throat> now, you wouldn't want to refuse the people who saved your life, would you, friend? You said no, you wouldn't refuse. That's a yes, right?
So yeah, the game does have voice dialogue if you say no. But the point is, after showing us around, we decide to join Blade to rebuild humanity. And the first job we get is to stick some poles in the ground. Seriously? So these are data probes, and pretty much the towers in Assassin's Creed, or IE, visit these to unlock the area of the map. Oh, and by the way, the map! Yeah, it's horrible on screen, but uh, did you forget? It's on the Wii U! You know, with the second screen that I still don't know how to record footage from! So pretty much the second screen is just you looking where to go, or to fast travel between these points. Anyway, with the first mission, you finally get to experience the wonder and horror of not being the dominant species. Because, oh my goodness! What the heck is that? Sinicula. 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 So at the first frontier nav point, we have to kill this giant bug thing. And here is around the time I really started to fall in love with the game. I know I said this before, but in my Xenoblade 2 reviews, I mentioned how I loved absolutely any media where it just shows how small the humans are. Like there is proof that there is something bigger out there. And well, what better than a game that has the earth destroyed and you're fighting for your life against hostiles on a planet you don't understand. Indeed. Anyway, we defeated and set up the first FN point. Now these also come very handy later on, and I did realise that too late, because to get money to buy things and such, you have to make sure you change the FN probes to different ones like research, mining, etc. Like there actually is a lot of thinking going into this to maximise your efficiency gathering materials. And let's just say, I did not do that. So we go back and meet Commander Van Damme. Huh, no, that name doesn't ring a bell. Fart. Indeed. He comes in to give a huge speech on which division in Blade we should join, with each helping to do some specialised skill in the world. But honestly, I didn't see any notable difference in what you pick. I guess it could be from the online, but like, playing this in 2019 is a weird experience. Let's start with your- In fact, let's expand on that. So this game has online, but like, do people still play the Wii U online? I find that surprising, but yep, here are plenty of people who apparently do. For what it's worth, and I'm sure someone in the comments can correct me. But I believe that these are just AI characters with names of other players, not actually them. Like in my 60 hours in the game, I had one interaction with someone online, and then I accidentally said no to their request because it happened near the end and I was so confused as what to do. Also, my Wii U keeps disconnecting, which is why randomly you will see in this footage, I'm either put in a squad online, or just offline. Anyway, Van Damme gives us our next mission. We're a team using a skull. I reported to have broken down somewhere in the southeast, and us three should go and investigate. Wait a minute, you remind me of that gorilla from Xenoblade 2. It's time for some payback. Uh. The group then finds traces of the team, but gets interrupted by these weird looking aliens who know who we are and are trying to kill us. Uh, that's strange, I thought this place was just full of animals. Anyway, we go further in, and find that these creatures have a base. Upon entering, see that the leader has now exterminated the team we were looking for. He then addresses us, saying how humans are intruders and must be eliminated. Elmer tries to reason with the prone, but fails. And we must defeat him. It's just kind of strange that out here in the wilderness we suddenly find an alien race hellbent on destroying us. So then as we leave... What should we do? Stay back, Lee. What do you think, Rook? So dark. Tatsu. Cat. Breathe. Oh. Oh. Ho. Tatsu finally free. Interesting. One of the vegetables is sentient. Talking potato. Hm. I wonder if it tastes different too. Ah uh, yeah, this is uh Tatsu. And I'll uh, get into his character floor later. And no, not because he's a nopon. But he reveals that he's part of an endangered species here. And that the prone were only recent invaders around the time we came. Presenting Bubble Ball! Really? 
Follow Ball. That's the best name you could come up with for your super special thing. Meh, meh, meh. What would friend prefer? Fancy name no one understands, so friend can feel smart? <laughs> well, now I know why they call themselves Blade. Oh, uh, uh, okay, uh, look at him dance. So he gives us the follow ball, which is just a thing to reveal where to go. And I kind of just forgot about using this thing after a few hours. Yes, it's very helpful, but this game has too many features to remember what to do. Agreed. Just one last thing. What the bloody hell is this dancing turnip doing here? He's actually a potato. So, uh, yeah, this is his biggest character trait flaw. Firstly, he does not help in battle at all. Hold up. Oh, well, maybe he has some other purpose in the game. No, he's just comic relief. And that being food jokes. Yes, lots of them. Well, I keep the oven. You spread the yogurt down your back too, okay? Bruh. Okay, but uh, shouldn't Tatsu be cleaning off yogurt instead? What? Don't be silly. We need it spread evenly for the tandoori sauce. <laughs> Tatsu is not laughing! Tatsu is not laughing! So now at the start of each chapter, we get to pick what food Lin makes, and this always, always leads to some joke about eating Tatsu. Oh, it's funny the first time, but six goes in. Ugh. I want to also mention here a bit the good and bad about the music in this game, as you'll see from the voice lines. The good is that it's a well-known anime composer, so if you're a fan of his anime music, you will absolutely love the soundtrack here. Uh, maybe not the song title names, however. But it is my belief, because of his renowned status, he maybe cost a bit too much for hiring for old small time monolith, and I think they paid him less in exchange for his music to be absolutely blasted at every single scene. There is no reason for it to be this loud. You can't increase or decrease the music, and this happens in so many cutscenes where you literally can't hear the characters. And I would be so lost if not for the subtitles. Anyway, I guess now since we get more freedom, I should talk about what you use the money for. And mostly, it's equipment. So you got a gun and a melee weapon, then you get armor for each part of the body. And yes, it does change your appearance. <laughs> um, uh, so, so if you're wondering what's up with my fashion sense, I picked it up because it has higher stats. I'm, I'm sorry if that's the only good thing Lin can wear in the game. She's 13. Later on though, I did realize you can do this thing called fashion armor, which means you get to keep any armor you want on, you know, so not skimpy things. But you can still then equip the stronger weird looking armor that will make people question you. So yes, Lin does get better clothing later in the footage. It's actually kind of a neat feature though. In where I wish more games like say Dragon Quest XI had because some outfits there you wanted to use throughout the whole game but then they're actually horrible stat wise near the finale. Well I'm gay. Also another thing I want to mention is the side quests as I know what you're thinking. Gee these sure are optional and I would then laugh at you because these are the people who made the Torna side quests. That's not funny. Oh no, not to say that they are bad, but over the course of the game, they really did start the grade on me. And that's the fact that to start a main mission, you need to complete some side quest requirement first. Like with Torna, the quests themselves can be fine, but when I'm forced to do them in a certain order, I kinda lose a bit of interest in them. Though they did help me keep my level close enough to the bosses, as oh lordy, this game has some really huge difficulty spikes. I'll get into that later, but just know you will be grinding and grinding in this game, which is then a good place to bring up the gameplay. Now I know at least what to expect from a Xenoblade game, and that is, I'll be doing as little as possible in the combat. Wait, what? By which I mean, the combat in these games are usually hands off, using auto attack to do most of the combat, but to be fair, X is at least way more hands on than 2 at least for me. So the battle begins by targeting an enemy, then either whacking or shooting it, and your character will keep whacking or shooting it until you press X to swap to the other style. Now with the auto attack, you can also build up this bar over here, and when at 3000, you can do an overdrive attack, which is pretty much Super Saiyan mode, allowing for faster combos with more benefits. Then over time you build up these skill abilities to use on a cooldown timer, and they all have varying effects. 
The main use for them though, is that your allies will yell out these attacks, and if you respond with the same colour when it flashes orange, you both slightly heal, and the attack does a bit more damage. Now this honestly the majority of what the gameplay is. You attack, building up the bar to overdrive, while listening to your allies to keep healing everyone. So then with the enemies, since they are huge creatures, you actually can lock onto a specific body part, and when destroyed, it topples the enemy, allowing you to do more damage. But yeah, I do know there is so much more strategy to the combat. For example, you can even change your class and weapons, change what the teammate is saying, even give them commands in battle, and honestly can be a bit much for some. Just focus on building the bar and keeping an ability free to heal everyone. Also, amusingly, I never knew you could actually control your teammates till like 12 hours in. When my whole team died and I was cowering in the corner, and I'm like, oh wait, what does this do? I'm just saying there are so many options in battle and so little explanations in game and I know I did have that problem in the second one. Now even though this is a lot to take in, I really, really enjoyed it. Probably more than two. It's one of the few games that I actually did enjoy grinding on, with the other being Tales of Assyria, which kind of has a lot of similarities with the customization. But at times, a lot of enemies you come across are so over leveled and even then you fight a monster that you can then beat, but some giant is then like, Oi, don't mind me, I'm just stomping on through, and interrupts the fight to just one-shot you. I guess it makes the game way more realistic, since you are small creatures struggling to survive. As you can then see me running away from a lot of enemies, using the environment to sneak away. Kinda reminds you of travelling right in the there, Elder Scrolls please. games. But with the gameplay, I want to point out, doesn't this feel like an MMO? What? No, I'm serious. You have the open world, created character, online squads, the fan servicey armor, the team battles on monsters, to the cooldown on attacks. This really does feel like a Wii U MMO, and I love it. The fact that this can be played offline really made me enjoy my time with this, and you shall then see with how nuts the story can get later on. Don't worry, I'll protect you. Hey, hey. Look who it is. Oh, looks like the game has Matt Mercer. Well, into the party you go. That is unfair. So Van Dam tells us that they might have found the Lifehold unit in Noctilum, a deep jungle area that is easily the scariest place for me. No joke, trying to set up fast travel points here was a nightmare since everything is so overleveled. Like this is not a tactic, you actually have to run and hide from monsters and not engage if you want to not die while scouting. Just like real humans in this situation would I guess. I mean there was even at one point I had to make my way north so I thought the safest way was to just swim around the whole dang island. This big brain play took me an hour to do and there was still no spot to re-enter the island from the sea. What? What? Anyway, we, Elma, Lynn, Potato, and Lau head off to the spot where we get interrupted by this blue dude called L. He tells us the life hold is further up and doesn't seem hostile. He just wants our sweet, sweet knowledge. Us kids, us tax. So after some dinosaur hunting, we arrive and find the prone are already attacking the ship parts. Our team tries to stop them but are too late. The prone then call in their commander. Ah, wait, I I'm still playing a Nintendo game, right? But She says she is part of the Ganglion Army, which the prone work for, and their duty is to wipe out humans. A bit oddly specific, but okay. We fight Gluteus Maximus Squidward, and before we can kill her, she flees in another mech. We then bring Elle back home to aid us and tell Blade of the Ganglion. Anyway, after this, I actually finally realized, like six hours in, uh, you can actually visit the other districts in the base. This will be a running theme in my playthrough. Realizing simple things so late in the game. But yeah, it was really fun running around here like 2B with less gravity. But uh, seems like the cars don't want to play nice. And for the most part, you will want to explore here and the game does force you to, to do all the side quests and things like that. Now since we got L, I gotta mention that the main party members are Elma, us, and Lin. But you can actually replace them for most non-story missions like Lau, L, Irina, Yosuke. Wait, what? 
or even other online players. But with the AI teammates, you can also customize their outfits, and I'm just saying that because when you dismiss them, they still wear it in every single cutscene. This is seriously getting close to Berseria levels of fun with the customization. Blade then detects a spaceship crashing to the east in Oblivia, a desert-like area. Making our way to the crash site, we find these things called Manon, who Tatsu says arrived only a year before us on the planet. So we go and talk to them. <laughs> Just remove my ears, please. That is a great idea. So these friendly people won't hurt us, apart from our ears, but are afraid of the ganglion, and will only trust us if we destroy some ganglion machines. Now I won't go into too much detail of how under leveled I was here, but a cool feature I found was that if you die, and had leveled up during the battle, you keep that level. This in addition to the many times you speed run in, and you somehow get stuck in a fight, the respawn area is further ahead than where you started. Trust me, I needed all this cheese when D with things like this. BS. Copy that. Now this next part can be considered kinda a spoiler, but when you look at it in the end, it's not really. So just a little caution here. Don't worry, I'll still give a big proper warning before the final boss. So we go back to the Manon and find them under attack by the Ganglion. Rushing in, we save them, and then Tatsu, you know, the character who is very valuable, starts dancing, which causes the last skull to fire a shot at him. Ramona bravely pushes him out of the way, but our arm is completely blown off. And this reveals the biggest and popular shock in fiction. We ain't human. Elma is like, wait, why are you shocked? We we all aren't human. Oh, right, right, the amnesia. Uh -huh. well, well, don't worry. We'll explain everything to you and to the fourth wall viewer back there when we get back to base. And so begins the Mimeosomes, or i.e. human clones. So the Lifehold unit is actually the home for everyone's real human body. Bodies. And the countdown in NLA is the time we have left before its backup power will die, killing us all. The biggest thing to take away from this is that it means a lot of these characters don't fear death that much since it's really not them. And the most important thing is to get to the life hold as soon as possible. Anyway, we introduce the high pitched boys to our leader and take them in, docking their ship in ULA. The next chapter then shows Booty Squid reporting to a ganglion boss, Luxar. And Yes, this is definitely an evil boss ruler design. Our next mission is to then find a ganglion skull in this monster guarded area. The enemies however won't attack if unprovoked, so this was kinda cool just wandering in. We find the mech which seems to run on dark matter, and call in our helicopters to take it back to the base. Tatsu however, the ever useful character, decides to eat, which draws in the beasts. And oh boy, this whole scene is truly where I felt like a helpless little human. We defeat it. Somehow. But it still keeps coming, until this giant death bird drops in and obliterates them. It acknowledges us, but doesn't kill the group and flies off. Well, that was kind of nice of it. Indeed. So back at base, NLA is set about to study the mech, while Luxar Soup talks with another race who works for him. Think of their army as just made up of different races that they conquered over time. It appears nothing is beneath me of late. Oh, hey there, Sojiro. Oh Irina's team then finds a part of the lifehold in Oblivia, and we go to help. Ramona and the others get there, and we almost open it, but all thick squid girl comes in to attack. And after another tough battle, Seriously, it's so hard battling these mechs as a scrawny human. We defeat her for good and return to NLA. Dinner is on me this time. Okay, this is weird. Very weird. Tatsu is suspicious. Holy moly, I love my sassy OC. Hmm, you're not half bad. Now one thing I'll give credit to Xenoblade 2 over this one, is that with the camera work during cutscenes, as at many times it's a free spinning one, which goes around our OC with a control stick. However, the cutscenes can go on for ages, and it can get very boring just staring at our backsides. Well, I mean, actually. But, but yeah, the other games at least made it feel more dynamic with the shifting camera. But here it's like just, hurry up. 
but I guess randomly, we now can get a scale license. Yep, we can ride them in the open world. Oh my goodness, this is so fun. This is true. So yeah, after doing a lengthy side quest, you get a really basic cheap mech. Now for the time being, this is fine, but the thing with scales is that they don't level up, and this one is level 25. You can buy level 30 mechs, and here is where you start to notice, oh lordy are we poor. Oh come on. So yes, if you were efficiently using the FN sites beforehand like I mentioned, this wouldn't be a problem, but for me, well, y you know. Very expensive. Anyway, so with the mech, you can run around everywhere on the overworld and fight any monster. Your special attacks depend on what weapon you equip, so if you're rich, you get better weapons. The scale also has its own overdrive feature, plus this lock ability, which can trap enemies from doing things while your teammates do the damage, like they are puny humans. Don't worry, when you have more money, you can buy as many mechs as you want. That's still a ways to go. Copy that. Also, two things with the scales. Firstly, Yes, they need fuel, and it can get quite expensive, so don't like ride in them if you don't need to, or you can abuse a tactic I found online. Wait, what? Secondly, is that if your scale is destroyed, well, make sure you press B at the right time, as then your insurance will pay for a new one. Otherwise, you have to pay for it all again, and this is seriously the worst thing ever. It becomes a bigger problem when your party gets their own mechs, and it's kinda hard to always keep a track of them. Alrighty, anyway, new mission. Same old Tatsu food joke. Oh, that's new. So it seems like the ganglion are on the offensive as they are approaching our city. Command tells our team to defend the east gate, Irina on the west one, and Lao to guard the alien mech that we captured. We then do some enemy wave battles, and I was kinda proud here that I beat an enemy all by myself as my team just gave up. But we then get called back into the city as the ganglion launched a huge dropship to land all these mechs in our home. Lao then tells his squad to go out there and protect the city, as there's no point guarding the mech if we get overrun. So we try and save the city when we meet these two, a huge guy and an evil girl. Huh. No wonder Xenoblade 2 has a thing for waifus. Bingo. We defeat them and they flee, while we get a call back from Irina that Sojiro and his cat girl manage to sneak in and steal the ganglion mech back. Anyway, we get back to the hangar. The bigger question is how they even knew we had it, and how did they know exactly where we were keeping it? No way. Okay, yep, that's it. Irina, get out of those clothes, put some actual armor on. You're on the starting lineup. Lao, you traitor, I'm benching you. No point of wasting levels on you, yep. Bingo. So our short shorts gang meets up with the president while at the same time, the cat people bring the mech back to Luxor who is very happy. Uh. Then our next mission is in Silvalum, which is north of here. And Blade believes this might be home to the ganglion army. Also, it's really cold. Perfect clothing then. But Upon entering the main area, we see Lao collapsed and force him to rest while we go further in to confront the ganglion he said that did this to him. However, we can't seem to detect anyone until a big ambush by the cat people in their mechs. We ask them why they are aiding Luxai, and he says it's because Luxai is holding his cat people as soldiers for his army. He then also reveals the ganglion's true goal is to destroy our real human bodies and not the clones. However, he can see that we might be good guys and agrees to a truce if we can beat him in a battle. Except we can't. What? Ah, uh, so well, this would be the first big, huge difficulty spike in the game. You have to defeat five enemies at once, then a mech battle. Now remember, I only had one mech, and a basic one at that. I mean, I tried so hard to win this, but it does seem like I do need to do some more grinding. And this is where the handy guides come in. Oh man, because there are so many tactics to level up, but my favorite one, and a lot of other people's, is this money farming guide in this cave. I'll leave a link in the description, but pretty much, it's this place in Noctilum that has a ton of item pickups. Now in this game, if you max out picking up one of an item, the next item pickup instead gives you money. So you can see where I'm going with this. Also, make sure you just do one lap and reload to the fast travel point on the touchpad as you want to not let the crabs spawn as they will attack you in this mech. 
So yes, I spent hours doing this to finally get two more mechs, which then finally allows us to easily beat the cats, and they agree to a truce, and reveal the ganglion bases north of here. Also mate, you did lose to a waifu in jeans. We also hear Lau has been brought safely back to NLA for treatment. Sojuro Cat then tells Luxa Soup, jeez, what am I even reading? That their alliance is no more. However, remember that big guy and the evil girl? Well, she's really angry that she lost and steals a mech from the ganglion. Well, not really a mech, more like a giant behemoth warship to crush us. Yay. Oh, come on. So we head to Silvalum to face her head on, and well, this was yet another difficulty spike against me, because my team just kept dying to the beast. So after some thinking and internet searching, I get enough money for stronger mechs and better weapons to finally take it down. During this time, we also do a side quest where... Oh. You what? Sorry, Irina. Back to the vent you go. My god, how adorable. I love cats. We then get called to our scale warehouse where we find Lau as he is stealing a data terminal with intel and he reveals he's a spy. Oh gee, what a shock. Jeez. He then flees while Command tells us that the data he stole is the key final component to finding the lifehold core. We go to confront him in the ganglion base in Calderos. So after making our way down into the head base, we find Lau who gives us the sob story of his family not getting chosen for the white whale as only the rich get picked, which is why he joined the ganglion to eliminate every human. A bit extreme, but okay. Luckily, we managed to somehow sneak our mechs in and easily beat him. Elma threatens to kill Lau for being the traitor, but Lin is like, no, please, he's like a dad to me. Ramona joins in and Elma stands down. Lau realizes the error of his ways and gives the data back. He says to leave him alone while we report home. And so we reach the final chapter. Now I want to mention this big fat warning to anyone before this chapter because okay so like with every mission you see there's a start at the start there's this warning okay once you start a mission you can't pick another one now i never really paid too much attention to this but that was my downfall during this chapter as you will see so first we announce to the public the location of the core and it's off the coast yep the whole time it didn't even land on the islands so every single blade heads out there but see the ganglion are already trying to break in, just barely failing with its last barrier. Luxa, at the same time, gets a report that we're all heading to the lifehold and decides to enter his mech to stop us. Prepare the feature. Also, by the way, he is the final save point before the boss, so uh, skip here if you don't want the finale spoilers, you know the drill. Pretty lady. As we enter, Elmo randomly says that DNA for all Earth life is on the white whale, and another bombshell that in fact, every single human body and animal was destroyed on Earth, but the capsules have all the consciousness of them, and can be used to restore their original life form. Kinda reminds me of that Futurama movie. Then, out of nowhere, the structure explodes as Luxa comes in with the Vita. It's kinda weird how I'm meeting the final boss like this when you know you never really met him till now. But okay, we battle him. And here is where my mistake bites me in my gene hide. So remember, all my mechs are level 30, this one is level 50, and for the life of me, I could not defeat him. I mean firstly, when you die, you have to make sure you know you're going to die beforehand and eject from the mech, otherwise when you spawn, you lose any chance of getting it back since you can't leave. And this includes telling your teammates to eject from the mechs as well, so it pretty much meant, I'm dying, get the Wii U long loading times when I reload the save, skip two cutscenes with the loading times, and to the life hold, skip another cutscene, battle his first phase, another cutscene, then try and beat the harder second phase. Now you may be thinking, okay, when well you're complaining, just grind a bit. Alright, fine, that works. But remember, the mechs don't level up themselves. I need level 50 mechs, which cost over 2 million credits for just one. Okay, so then my problem is money. I could just grind in the cave. But remember how long it took me to just get one level 31? One. Well, it would take even longer for a level 50 mech and one at that. Alright, fine. I'll look up some guides then. Maybe I'm missing something. And I did. I found something. A side quest that gives you mechs which you can then sell for profit. But here's the big 
problem. Since I started chapter 12, I can't do any, and I mean anything else till I beat it, i.e. beat the game. I'm effectively locked into this quest, and of course, only one save file in a Xenoblade game, so unless I grind for like 10 hours, I'm stuck. And I mean, honestly, I really tried my hardest in the battle, but to no avail. I guess this is where I tap out. Oh, but don't worry, I'll still be talking about the ending, just, uh, using my art since apparently I'm an artist. Jeez. Anyway, during the boss battle, Luxa says humans are descended from Samarians, and these people are the ones who created Ganglion as their servants. Now anticipating an uprising, they built a failsafe into them, and in turn their descendants, the humans. That would spell the end of the Ganglion race. But we then defeat him and his Vita sinks into the pool. Now with a job well done, Elma opens the console to demonstrate how the DNA thing, rebirth thing works. But oh no, Luxa ain't dead and attacks the computer, causing some mutated lizards to appear and attack us. We defeat them and again, out of nowhere, Lau comes in and stabs Luxa with both falling into the pool. Lau realizes that failsafe was just human DNA, which is all around them in the pool. And this dissolves Luxa. Oh, you, you know, I was kind of hoping for something more cool than just human DNA being the reason ganglions were angry at us. Lau tries to swim out, but the dying Luxar grabs onto him, fusing with him into this hideous beast. Lin tries to protect him again, but Elmer's like, come on, Lin. Look at what he's doing. He's destroying our ticket out of these clones. And surprisingly, Lau agrees and that we should stop him. So the final fight, we defeat Lau Hybrid, who dissolves into the pool. Lin says the computer is fine to create create life, and so we turn on the backup power. Elma then out of nowhere is like, oh by the way, I'm an alien. What? What? She apologizes for lying for like 60 hours of gameplay, and reassures us that it's still her. The Blade HQ contacts and congratulates us on destroying the ganglion threat, and we return home. The epilogue then talks more about Elma, who arrived to Earth in the late 2020s, and she gave humans info on how to build skulls, clones, and spaceships. Lin somehow believes that Earth is still alive, and that more ships might have escaped as well. Then after the credits, Elmo returns into the core to get our consciousness out of there. But another shock, it's completely ruined. Most likely from the crash landing impact. This leaves Blade at odds with what to do now. Because well, their consciousness from Earth is dead, and yet them as the clones are still alive and existing. Elma suggests that this planet might be doing some mystic mumbo jumbo, and we then see Lau on the beach while a shadow of a figure walks up to him, and he opens his eyes, cutting to a black screen with a text that the story never ends. What the hell was that? So, uh, that was, uh, interesting. The sum, that was some ending. Uh, so, like, uh, cliffhanger, maybe? Okay, um, so everyone is fine and alive, but, uh... I really don't know how to express my thoughts on that ending. For a game that started out with such a strong premise, it kind of just fizzled out with weak characters and villains and a sequel bait. <laughs> I mean, finding out Elma is an alien is cool, although I prefer the clone design way more. But that little sequel bait just seems really out of place. I mean, we barely know anything about Luxa as a villain, and yet there's still someone else and Lau is yet again alive. Oh yeah? Oh yeah? Wait, what? Anyway, we bring the spoiler skippers back, because honestly, if you have a Wii U there, you know, gathering dust, and if it's cheap, I 100% say you should buy this game. I mean, you get 60 hours worth of enjoyment from it easily, and that's not to mention the numerous things I skipped over. Like, did you know this has social links? Yeah, you can level up with a certain party members to know more about them. The game is just so massive, which I guess shows you with the loading times, but it's so surprising how they managed to fit this all on the Wii U. This game would then be even more amazing on the Switch. And maybe just rework the story a tad bit. And also some of the level grinding and mission structure. That being said, I still thoroughly enjoyed my time with this. I guess it helps that I'm suddenly on a really high kick of giant mechs recently. Coupled with the amazing soundtrack, voice acting, expansive detailed worlds, the fact that you can make your own waifu or husband -o, and the customization showing in the cutscene, raises the game a lot in my eyes. 
It's just a shame the mid and late game story and difficulty dropped it down a peg or two. But with that, oh boy, I sure have spent a lot of time talking about Xenoblade on this channel. Maybe it's time for a long break. Who knows if I'll ever come back to the older Monolith games. 10,000 likes and I'll do Xenoblade 1, okay? Trojan, Ramses, Magnum, Sheik!